Oh, I wonder if it's. I did something wrong. Is it playing? We are live. Yes, we are live. However, <laughs> I must we have done. Live. I must have done yes, something wrong. Live. Windows updates changed everything. We are live once again, Friday, I like the shrew September 13th. That's Friday the 13th. Welcome, everybody, to another exciting episode of Conspiracy You're Not Here. We come for your listening displeasure. Um, we have Gandalf and Amy, as usual, but we also have a very interesting guest by the name of Steep Six. He is a clinical psychologist, so welcome, everybody, and welcome, Steep Six. <coughs> <clears throat> How's it going, everyone? Thank you, everyone. Well, yeah, Steep Six, man. This is the first uh, I've ever talked to you, so I'm really looking forward to this, man. You sound a lot better, Gandalf. Feeling nice better? Nice to meet you, Gandalf. Yeah, it's uh, it's still kind of there, like I'm fucking uh, hacking, you know, a still, a sneezing man, but uh, I feel good, man. I'm not really like, I was, oh, it was the most uh, terrible sickness I think I've had in years last week. Okay, so welcome. We've got uh, Allison Twist is hanging out with us already. Amy, how you been? Oh, I've been hanging in, uh, you know, getting by slowly but surely. All right. So, um, Steep Six, um, your first name is Daniel, and it shows up on your avatar. So I'm just going to refer to you as Daniel from now on, if that's all right with you. So that'll shoot. That's, that's fine. Um, so you are indeed a clinical psychologist, correct? Yes. Do us a favor. Uh, bring us up to speed. Tell us a little bit of, give us a little background on you and how you kind of got into doing what you're doing, how you came across our channel and you came to meet Amy. And um, so uh, just uh, sort of introduce yourself. Yeah, I always thought that you, you deserved a bigger audience. I enjoyed the show that, that you do. And um, uh, I'll bring you up to speed on me. I started out working. I think my first job was a lifesaver at a lake nearby. My second job was picking fruit. And my third job was a protective service officer in the security industry. And I worked there for about 10 years. Um, the industry got a little bit rough for me in the end and I decided to do follow 
basically a passion I had in behavioral science. So I used my, um, my status as an Aborigine to get free university education. And I completed a degree course, a four year degree course in two years. <laughs> because I was in a hurry and getting older, which was a community science and services degree in behavioral sciences, which qualifies me as a clinical psychologist, but we prefer to call ourselves counselors. There's a bit of a stigma that comes along with being called a psychologist, um, especially in the um, uh, the, the community that uh, like to question things tend to blame psychologists for a lot of the problems <laughs> in and to some extent there is truth in that I mean I had professors who were communists made no bones about that and we'd get into arguments and we'd have to shut shut the whole thing down before you know, it got out of control. I was never excluded for disagreeing with communism and only one of the professors I had was a card-carrying communist, but most of the others were in some way socialist or at the very least, in, in my opinion, politically correct to a point of nausea. So it was a bit of a struggle to get through and that was another reason why I was in a hurry to do it. So I didn't have to deal with these people for too long. But um, there is a lot more to psychology than most people understand. And, and we all live our lives every day to some extent, being people um, using our own, you know, our own body language and um, our voice to hate in certain ways. Some people manipulate, some people, um, and we're going to get there. Uh, some people go into politics and they turn psychology into a, into a profession um, politically. And you'd call that rhetoric. And so, for example, Barack Obama is a, a law, but that law degree, at some point, he studied psychology. And he became a terrific orator. And he ended up becoming president of the United States. His voice. And just recently, Donald Trump did the same thing. It was, they were able to sort of mesmerize the population, the words that come out of their mouth and the way that they say it to a point that gets them into the highest positions of power. And so we sort of, we see a lot of uh, politicians are lawyers. And so in, in law, psychology is extremely important. Um, yeah. So I want to talk about flat earth. <laughs> okay. Because I've got, I, I, have a, I have like a personal interest because I did actually see a convincing video and it got me thinking that how did I know that the earth was round? It, it was a sphere. How did I know that? And I couldn't really answer that question. And then one video led to the next. And after I'd watched about 10 videos and uh, 10 or 20 hours later, I was starting to question my reality that I believed all my life that the earth was a sphere. And I thought, 
well, the damn thing could be fled. And in order for me to deal with that, I really had to then go deeply into the science and, and try and understand that in a way that made sense to me. And in doing so, basically undid the conditioning that had occurred while I was watching those Flat Earth videos. Now, there are some, and then I went back and rewatched them um, with an open mind. And I discovered that what's going on there is that some of them do believe that the earth is flat. I believe they believe. But the majority of them and the bigger voices, I think, is Mark Sargent one of the leaders? Is that a name? Have I got that right? Yeah, he is. And I have an interesting video to share. Yes. <laughs> okay, yes. Now, Mark Sargent, I was watching videos <laughs> on him because big question marks come up when I, I, I was watching him being interviewed and I can assure you that he he does not believe it himself okay I am 99% sure that Mark Sargent does not believe the earth is flat what makes you <laughs> say that I agree with you I totally agree in fact most people who are familiar with Mark Sargent would completely agree with that statement yes I'm curious yes. from, from your you from your point of view um, someone who has had courses in psychology and works as a basically a psychologist um what 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 what, what clued you into this his body language it was purely his body language he was in he was and the, the one that really did it was for me was when he was taken to the beach he was shown something go over the horizon and he said well that's heat okay and the the reporter who was interviewing him said, do you really believe that? And the camera was trained on him when she said that. And his body language was 100% consistent with someone who did not believe that. <laughs> he, he basically laughed at himself at that point. Now, he was either really stoned and couldn't control it, or he truly doesn't believe it, but sometimes people who are stupid, it's harder for them to hide the reality of what they're doing. So I see the Flat Earth community as a, a portion of it are people who are practicing rhetoric and they may be uh, under direction, they may get a thrill out of causing discord um, and another portion are people who believe it and they run with it and it becomes their reality and the ones who the, cling on to it bitterly uh, and believe it are the ones that you will never change their mind because those people are actually sociopathic and if you are to question their belief the way they believe it because they convince that they're right if you are actually to uh, put them in a situation where they actually have to question reasonably their belief, you're making a you're sort of opening up pathways to force them to question other parts of their lives. To do with a sociopath, it can actually cause more harm than good. So getting into an argument with someone who truly believes the earth is flat um, and someone who starts saying things like, um, everything's CGI and I've, I see these videos where people started to tell me that the sky was all CGI um, and, and pictures taken of the planet are CGI and some of them are. Um, NASA has um, a bunch of composite pictures of the planet that they say this is the Earth and there are a couple of contradicting photos of what they say is the planet and there's only 10 years difference between them and then there's anomalies with the you know going to the moon and space flight and those small things that we can't explain and we needn't bother with are the 
is the genesis of this everything is a lie conspiracy theory. And it's helped to question reality. It's humans try to make sense out of everything that we see. But some, for some people, their whole lives kind of get wrapped up in this, I've been deceived and I need to find the truth. And when they go down a road, like um, all the history we've been taught is a lie. And once they've gone a certain distance down this road, and they've made videos telling people that that's the case, they'll never be able to go back for a percentage of people. And, and these are the people who are more likely to make videos. These are the people who um, they, they, they want to make themselves popular. They want people to listen to what they have to say. And this is not everybody, but this is one of the tendencies of, of a sociopath or a psychopath or a narcissistic personality. So the people who have made the most videos and gotten the most attention on the subject are the least likely to actually go back and question um, the beliefs that they had in the first place. And there's a couple of people online who I really do admire, but have a, they, they have a touch of this. And, um, a, David Icke and Max Egan. Are two <laughs> Go ahead. And now, I don't believe that either of those people are deliberate shills, or they're accused of it often. I know Max personally, and I'd love to meet David, but I do believe that they both believe what they say is true. And now, Max, he, his education was limited and a sort of an, an autodidactic, what I've read sort of thing. And you can get to a point, and I think Alex Jones has done this himself with history, where he's read too many history books and then starts spouting things off that make no sense and, and, are, and are not said anywhere that I can find. But um, Max, his lack of education, his lack of... Um, Formal education has led him to the belief that what he knows, uh, he's, ma he's making a statement that the English language has been corrupted. Now, he has actually gone to university and studied English. Yes, for him, maybe he does struggle in articulating his points. But the truth of the matter is that English is one of the uh, better languages on the planet for describing anything you want. <coughs> now, he'll, he'll say something like, what does the word tree mean? How does it describe a tree? And then I'm thinking, oh, God, Max, you know, like we have a name for every tree. Okay, now, if you want to describe your tree, you say the name of the tree that you want to describe. And, and we have three words for tree. And they all they come from the Greek and the, and the Latin and the French. And English is a conglomerate of um, basically five languages, which is why we have four or five words for just about everything that we say and subtle differences in meaning. And there are not many languages on the like this. French, uh, they're very patriotic and very protective of their language, and they won't allow new words into it. So they are restricted. So they, they will, French people will learn English so they, or German so that they can communicate more clearly um, with other people. They didn't have this problem because anyone who was academic knew Latin. And, and Latin was the language of Europe, and you could go anywhere in, in the continent, and you could speak to, you could listen to lectures, and you could speak to other students in Latin. Um, the biggest 
mistake that happened in education was taking that Latin away from, um, you know, Western Europe. That happened about two, 200 or 150 years ago, and it died off completely about 60 years ago, where Latin was no longer taught to anyone except and doctors. But it was a brilliant way for all of Europe to communicate. But the, the result of this is in English, is that we do have about, we have about three times or four times more words than any other language on the planet. And whether or not we know these, most people operate on a vocabulary of about 500 words. Um, people who are educated and whose brains are working work between 10 and 20,000 words. But like we have a million words to choose from, and this is all the time you'll be reading and you'll see a word and you go, what the hell does that mean? And this is where, you know, dictionaries come in handy and now the internet. So I'll be reading a book and I'll see a word and I'll go, well, I can't remember, or I don't know what that means. So I type it into Google and I get a definition for it. And it's happening all the time. And through doing that, we can actually build our vocabulary. And I think if Max was as well read as he used to be, and as well educated in history as he claims to be, then this would have happened to him. And he would have realized himself how diverse the language is. But he's sort of taking himself down this path where now, have you heard of the mud flood? Oh, yes. Okay, I, I, I knew that's where you were going to go when you brought up Max Egan. Yep. I knew, I, I've heard of the mud flood. I don't know. I don't know if the world was flooded in 1850 because I'm not 170 years old. But it's unlikely. <laughs> and... Anybody with a reasonable um, grasp on history would understand this. And the photos and the proof that something did happen, so incongruent that for someone as intelligent as Max to run with it and to make it a part of his, his um, you know, a part of his product, or so to speak, is is irresponsible, okay? Because he does have the ear of a quarter of a million people and they, they hang on every word he says and he brings up things that, that these people then believe. So, look, um, one, of the mo one of the most, my favorite quote in the whole world is written down here. And this is how it goes. It's, he who should know the history of words would know all history. And that was written in politically incorrect, of course, uh, or incorrect probably isn't the right word, politically inadequate. But it was written in 1949 by a historian named Will Durant. And now, Will Durant, did you read uh, Rufus that chapter I sent you? A dialogue between Benedict the Fourteenth and Voltaire. Oh no, I'm I'm terribly sorry. I, I it's I meant to, and I meant to get back to it, and it slipped my mind, and I just I didn't get back to it. So no, I did haven't read it yet. I'll forgive you. Read it in the future. I'd love to discuss this with you because you and I, um, we can debate theology because you are an atheist and I am a Christian, but I'm not the kind of Christian that you think most people are. And I don't really think you're the kind of atheist that most people are. But that that dialogue, which is, um, what was it? Something in Elysium? That dialogue between it was written by Will Durant after writing a book on Voltaire, the age of Voltaire. 
and it it basically crystallizes religion and not not so much the the controlling factor of religion although that is an element to it but there's the civilizing uh, influence of religion and the the un uh, unifying aspect of religion and Benedict says to Voltaire, where do you get off in one lifetime in questioning the wisdom of an entire race over thousands of years? And now Will, Will Durant himself was an atheist, but in the end he said, I, I kind of question that belief now after studying all history. He still wasn't a, a theologian, but he started to understand that religion throughout history actually had quite an, a, a positive impact in many ways. And we can argue all day the, um, the, the, the pros and cons of that um, <laughs> with the, you know, the, the inquisitions and the, the, um, the sub, sub, subversions and the, mm -hmm. and the suppression okay. of science and the uh, suppression of science, but, and the subversion of, of women and slavery and the endorsement of slavery and the, and the subjugation of women. Yeah. Now so, this is, see the church was made up of men and it became an institution, the Catholic church and an institution of men became corrupt because it was made up of men, but it was the only institution. It was the political, um, the center of the world. And that, that's where all the people who wanted power gravitated. And as a result, we get these horrible things that come out of it. And then there was a, a backlash, which was the, the Reformation. And uh, the, the Albigensian movement, the, the Cathars in Southern France, they seem to have a, a secret that when they look, when you look into that more deeply, you'll see that they weren't so religious and all of the things that you hate about religion, they did too. And of course they were wiped out to a man, man, woman, and child. And everyone in the area was wiped out because they, the established church could not allow that uh, ideology to spread, threaten their monopoly on power. That does not indict religion itself. That indicts men. That indicts humanity as as a whole. Humanity did that. So, so when you say that they hated all the things that are about religion that I hate or that you think that I hate, would that include the fact that this and, and I'll just express one of the things I hate most about religion in general, not specific religion, not not the action that men in religion have taken, but religion in general gets grown adults to believe in things for which there is no good reason to believe. That's a sweeping I mean, general. I mean, I, 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 put that as I put that as tactfully as I possibly could. What I wanted to say in a more harsh sense is that it gets intelligent grown people to believe in fairy tales. Well, the established religions have done that. They've done that forever. And the, you have, for an example, the flood. Now, the flood story, clearly a thinking person doesn't need to believe that the entire world was flooded. Okay, but there was an ice age and it did end and, and there were massive floods all over the world and geologists will tell you this. Mm -hmm. uh, hundreds of flood myths. And the, um, the, the Hebrew version of the flood myth is basically a copy of the, the Babylonian flood myth, which was a copy of the Assyrian flood myth, which was a copy of the original flood myth from Mesopotamia, which came from the Sumerians. They, the name changed every time, and slight details did, but the overall story and what was, is the same. And whether or not that happened in the Black Sea or in the Mesopotamian Valley is 
is neither here nor there, but there would have been at some point in human's history a great flood in that area. And somebody survived, and whether they were told to by a spirit or a god or aliens is, is up for debate, but someone survived because they told the story. And, you know, I, I can't sit here and say I believe that Noah survived the flood and that we are all descendants of Noah. I can't say that we, Adam and Eve, were the first two people and that we are all descendants from Adam and Eve because none of that really makes logical sense. There are uh, movements within Christianity and they are silenced by the established religions who appreciate the power that they have over people and they're shut down and we can go right back to the first saints who were, who were saying that what I'm saying now is that these stories that came out of religion are need, we, we need, when we, with our senses and our reason, discover things about the world, we should then question our interpretation of scripture. Now that was heresy, but that was in the beginning of Christianity, that was actually um, a very powerful movement. And the, um, now I've got to get this right. It was the movement who didn't believe that Jesus was the son of God, that he did exist, but he wasn't an incarnation of God. And I can't think of the name, I share a name with somebody else. But they became the most heretical part of Christianity very early on because they were questioning a doctrine and dogma. And doctrine and dogma have maintained its grip on the, the Christian religion throughout history and have made it this institution that you and I both despise. But the core of Christianity itself, the, the lessons, the, the oral histories that were turned into written histories, um, the, the learning and the, the generations of, of accumulated knowledge, there is something there that has benefited civilization. And basically, it is that we as humans are inclined to uh, selfishness because for thousands and thousands and thousands of years, if we weren't, we were dead and we didn't breed. We had to be selfish, we had to be licentious, we had to be ready to steal and kill, and we had to be um, moral -less. We had to have no moral compass in the way that we look at it today as together as initially. Otherwise- We have no moral have... compass? That's right, because- You, you, think, you think that's be... true? You think we had no moral compass? You think that's true? No, I think, I think we do now. And maybe- well, wait, well, No, wait a minute. Even as hunter-gatherers, we were still a social species, correct? In a way that- Doesn't it, well, bene doesn't it benefit a group who is engaged in social species-type act activity wouldn't it benefit the group to have moral compass? And, and is, not, is it not observed in primate species and literally in dog species and other types of social species, literally like pigs, species that have a hierarchy among their troops, that there is uh, some moral compass even among the lower animals? Oh, sure. And, and that to survive as a species, we must have that at our core. And that's what came through as civilization developed and groups of people had to come to live together who a disparate uh, people had to come to, to live together in harmony without killing each other and and stealing each other's stuff and and screwing each other's wives and causing chaos in the community i like this, the, i like the, i like the way christopher hitchens puts it when he says am i to believe that the two million jews who exited egypt 
and wandered in the desert for 40 years, made it all the way to Mount Sinai, had no idea that killing, raping, and perjury were, were wrong until they got to the foot of Mount Sinai and Moses came down and all of a sudden they realized, oh, that's not kosher. Well, they, they, they wouldn't have made it that far, he says, and I agree. It's just not possible that these ideas, this quote-unquote golden rule, this idea that morality comes from God, or morality comes from religion, I just, I find that laughable. No, but it, as, a, as a unifying, like, the first set of laws that we know about were written by someone named Uruku Jina. And he said, I'm king, these are the laws, and you have to follow them. Those, those laws we know about because they were chiseled in diorite and we've, we've dug up the, the rocks that have his laws written on them and they were written in about 3000 BC. They didn't last very long and the reason they didn't last very long in my opinion is because he said these are my laws. The next set of laws to come out that people actually start to follow came from Hammurabi and he didn't say these are my laws. He said these are God's laws. God is telling you to do this. And the priests enforce those laws, not the actual king or the leader himself. So um, Hammurabi's laws are still with us today. But what I'm trying to say is that as a, a way to get men who are, at a, we are instinctual species and instinctually we are selfish we have to train ourselves not to be and for communities large numbers of people to come together and live in communities it was necessary maybe to stretch the truth or to lie to them about where these directives on how to live come from because if we're going to do it and we're not going to be running around killing each other stealing each other's stuff and screwing each other's wives and fighting all the time we need to have this code of ethics. And the best way that the people who were trying to make that happen at that time understood was to say that this is coming from the gods. Now, this is probably a superstitious element in within humans um, that we don't know how far it goes back. We've seen chimpanzees worshiping um, waterfalls. Uh, well, what? Anthropologists would say it looks like they're worshipping waterfalls. Uh, so maybe that superstitious element in humanity was a blessing in a way when it came to saying, let's get together, let's work together, and let's not do all these things. And the Ten Commandments, if you strike off the first three, which basically are saying, you know, you must follow the rest because I am the ultimate God. If you strike them off and you just look at them, they are the set of morals by which we need to live. If we wish to live in harmony and, and without conflict, constant conflict and uh, upheaval. Uh -huh. and, how, and how's that worked so far? Well, look at where we've come. We, yeah. We have, yeah, in constant conflict. Yeah, it's a, it's a constant... So so they, my question they, again, they, how does that work so far? There. That instinct is always there. It's still there now, and it's probably going to take a million years to get rid of it, if or maybe tens of thousands of years. But if what we're told is true and, and civilization is only 5,000 years old, give or take a millennial or two, then for us to have... Um, changed for our natures to have changed in that amount of time is unrealistic to, uh, to think okay so the reason we still see all of this stuff going on is because that is the instinct of humans okay that is going to be there for a long time to come and to get us off the ground to get civilization working we needed to have some sort of superstitious belief that uh, and, it, and it manifested in an afterlife, and uh, maybe there is some spiritual um, thing that happens after we die. Maybe there's not, but 
people had to be told that their behavior in this life was going to affect what happened to them for eternity. And that was the only way at that point in time to get people to actually stop the, killing each other, screwing each other's wives. And that didn't work very well, did it? But it did. If it didn't work at all, we wouldn't be in any kind of civilization now. We would still be constantly fighting. We are constantly fighting. Well, we aren't. I mean, it's, yes, the, and, and we can now take this to a, a conspiracy level where the people in charge of us want us to do these things, and it's easy for them to convince us to do these things because they are at the core of our nature, and they can manipulate humanity to do these things. Even if we don't go to the conspiracy side of things, people have a natural proclivity to, mostly, I think, because of their own egos, people have a natural proclivity to one-up each other. And in terms of a social species like ours, who have the ability to communicate through language, we one-up each other by proving each other wrong. And you can see this all the time on Hangouts, you can see it in comment sections, comment threads. You see it where any type of social interaction is occurring, particularly online, where people have a little bit more free reign to speak their mind because they have anonymity. And, you know, you're not standing in front of someone who you're offending and you, you don't have the threat of getting punched in the mouth when you say something foul. And you can really express how you really feel, which is a lot of what goes on in these comment threads. And, and then we always want, find ourselves in these silly micro debates between each other where we're always trying to, even in, even in situations where we maybe mostly agree with each other, we tend to play devil's advocate. It's, it's a natural, and this is why I want to talk to you. This is a subject, I have a note on this specifically, how we have a natural tendency to play devil's advocate with each other. I think, and, and you can speak to this as so someone who's got some psychology training, that this, I, this, this natural proclivity for people to play devil's advocate with each other and with ourselves um, is a form of... Um, of um, it's a form of one-upmanship. It's it's I think largely powered by the ego, and yes. it, and it's it's driven many many ma uncountable an infinite amount of conversations online to turn into somewhat heated debates. Yes, yes, this is uh, narcissism. This is the narcissistic tendency of people, and the people who engage in this do have that. Okay, I don't. All right, no, I have in the past, but I won't do it anymore. And what happens is someone, if somebody feels questioned, if someone feels like their truth is being questioned, they feel an anger rising in them. They're, they're third to wrath, a certain degree, depending on the, how narcissistic they are. And you will get these arguments about nothing. And it happens in comment sections. I see it, I read it, and I know what it is. And But it's not everybody. It's just a section of the community who are, happen to be most vocal in that particular area. But you're right, it's a, it's a, it's a true representation of our core nature. If, if somebody uh, has a comment on what something somebody says, okay, if they disagree with them, and instead of saying, I respectfully disagree with what you say, how about this? They say, you're a fucking moron. <laughs> get your head out of your ass. Now, that is really not constructive, okay? And, and that there is no debate there. It is an instant argument. It's an instant battle. And then the person who's just read that comment, they feel indignant, not just that somebody has actually questioned them, but the way they've done it. They've basically insulted them. Right. I've insulted their intelligence. Right. And, and because it's a because it's a public forum, now the ego starts to take over. Yeah, so their response is is disproportionate or proportionate, depending on how you look at it. Uh, and they will attack back. And you you end up with horrific things being said, people who don't even know each other. And this is we've come full circle and we've come back to this like it's like the beginning of civilization in the internet. There is no rules. There is no moral 
compass. People will behave in a way that is in the, that is core to their nature, but it's it's contrary <laughs> to uh, living in harmony, basically. And we have noticed that children, especially, are becoming more and more depressed and more and more suicidal as they more and more tech. And it's and we believe it's because they are not connecting with each other the way that you and I would have when we were kids and we had on, no a, on a human level, literally going yeah. outside and playing physically with each other and interacting learning, on a human level. Learning how to interact. Yeah. As children, they're not getting the same education, which is education from experience. It's not happening because a lot of their communication is happening in the internet where there is a whole new set of rules that we as a species have never had to cope with before, which is, as you said, anonymity and um, also becoming the center of attention. We have people now going into debt to, to incredible amounts of debt they'll never pay back just to take selfies and post on Instagram of them wearing the latest clothes, of them going on trips to Disneyland, and they, they wouldn't do it. And they will get up and admit, I would never have bought that $2,000 dress. Didn't have Instagram to share it with everybody on. If I didn't feel like I'd be inadequate if I didn't do it, or I wouldn't, um, if I, I, I wasn't I'm keeping up with the Joneses this old term. Sure. And that's what they're doing, not on a community level, but on a massive level. And people start with these, and it is, mostly affecting people with these narcissistic tendencies that they need to feel as if people are paying attention to them. And you'll see it in children and we learn as we grow that that's probably not uh, a great way to continue um, life by, you know, being the center of attention is not necessarily the greatest thing in the world. And it's people are not growing out of it. Okay. The, the millennials. Uh, well, oh, hang on. Hang on. When you say people are not growing out of it, I have another question on that subject. It's an observation that I've made, and maybe I'm missing something, and you can speak to this. Amy and, and Gandalf and everybody in the chat maybe could weigh in. Um, it's just an observation that I've made because I've been online pretty much since, you know, the inception of the Internet, all the way back in the days of AOL dial-up and all that. And something that I've noticed with the way people interact with each other, back then in the early days, people were much harsher than they are now. And I know that we just got done speaking about how people can easily get very rude and, and foul and harsh with each other, particularly because it's the Internet and you're protected by anonymity. But something that I've noticed over the last you know, 15, 20 years is that even in the comment sections, if you recall 15 years ago, comment sections in chat rooms, that it was much worse than it is now. So I would disagree with you that we're not learning and growing and figuring out how to communicate in better ways, even in this realm of the Internet, simply because even though you're protected by anonymity, I think that you're you still, you know, you have an online presence and you have a group of friends and you have a reputation to uphold. You know what I mean? So maybe you could agree or disagree. Maybe you've noticed this observation. But I think that even even though we can still see elements of people who can quickly get nasty at each other, I think overall there's been quite a bit of calming down. Back then, I remember it was much worse. What, what say you? Well, I think you're right. And I think that a lot of that has to do with the reduced anonymity that has come with the Internet in recent times. In the early Internet, nobody could find out who anybody was and you, you were your handle and that was it it's not the case anymore you actually you have a facebook you have an instagram well, well i don't but people do and they do have an actual um uh, an actual a personality or character that is and, and a group of friends that they have online now that they have to have main reputation so they have reined this back in. I have noticed it too, that um, people are, a, a section of the community is becoming more polite. 
in the comments section, and I've noticed it over the last eight years. So eight years ago, it was vicious. I, I perhaps I haven't actually uh, seen much of that. I mean, I used to hang out in IRC back in the day, and yeah, there was always some jerk, but mostly all my experiences were reasonably, uh, you know, at least polite, if not, you know, super congenial. I, I, I never really noticed that there was a lot of nastiness. I think most people would tend to be polite. Yeah, there is a section. There is a section of uh, humanity as a whole, which yeah. have these narcissistic tendencies, and those are the people who are more likely to comment on a video, are more likely to tweet all day, and I respond to other people's tweets. No, I don't. I. Go ahead. I would tend to agree. Ahead, with, I would tend to agree with that. Actually, um, you know, if you check out a lot of the comments that are left here and there, it's people that want attention you know what i mean so i just think but uh, to get back to where you were talking about with an anonymity i i think that um i think it's really an illusion of an anonymity and i think that that's starting to disappear as people get actually doxxed and places like 4chan people are getting um you know they're getting police sent to their door over posts that they leave on this apparently an anonymous uh, message board Well, there's definitely that element. I, I agree with Steep6 when he brought up the idea of all these other social media outlets like Facebook and Twitch and Snapchat. And now we have, um, you know, the U the way YouTube is operating now with live streaming and everybody, a, a lot of people are showing their faces, whereas in the early days, it was it was pretty damn anonymous. There were nobody, hardly anybody, if anybody, was showing their face on camera. It was a lot of... A, a lot of reluctancy to do that. So in that sense, I think he's correct. Where There's more of a human presence to our social media accounts, which might be part of it. Um, I think even for those who don't have, uh, even for people who have never shown their faces, um, even some of the larger channels who have never shown their faces and, and don't have Facebook accounts as associated with all of their family photos and all the personal stuff, I think that the idea that even your online persona that we're 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 trying to maintain somewhat of a um a per, uh, um a credibility amongst you know our group our in group our friends and even potential you know passers by strangers because it is it is a public forum and we do have a reputation somewhat to protect for, at least for those of us who give a shit about our reputation. Yeah, totally. Uh, the, it that, that's it. The, the larger the community has become, the more people uh, are in the community, then uh, the more, um, say, responsibility you need to take for your online presence. Now, but what Gandalf was saying is correct. It's that it's not everybody who is interacting in an antisocial way, but there is a segment of, pe of the, our community, our society that has a tendency to behave antisocial. Now those people who, who who do it online, they would probably do it in real life as well, but it comes out sooner on the internet because there are certain barriers and there is certain disconnect from you and everyone else. You're not seeing body language, you're not getting nuance. You you read a comment and you're not hearing the way that the person says it. Okay. And you might read, I have made comments and people have read them completely. Um, the inverse of what I intended to say. And then right. Right. There's that too, because you, you're lacking inflection, voice inflection and, and tone of voice, things like that. I get it. Go ahead. Yes, Sorry. But I realize, I realize the person who has, who has read that, um, in the opposite way of what I meant it to communicate is somebody who is defensive. And this is, we're always going to keep falling back on this sociopathic narcissistic tendency um, of, this, our, of a section of our 
our society as a whole, um, which is the, also the most present, the most, and these are the people who before the internet were, you know, the actors and the politicians and the, the personalities that we all knew now, they are, even the, the, the most, the least talented of them have an opportunity to make a presence online with an internet channel, uh, like on YouTube, a Twitter, an Instagram, or a Facebook, or something like this. And this is where we go back to the flat earth. There is a, there is a thing about knowing something that most other people don't. And that makes a narcissistic person feel some kind of power. And if they can then project that out into the world and say, I have a secret and here's the, the proof, and they can use <coughs> their rhetoric skills to convince you that what they believe to be true is the truth, <coughs> then they, f they feel a genuine, um, they get a, an endorphin rush or a dopamine hit that a regular person or someone who's more stable won't get. So they really do, they put their lives into this. And like, I, I'll watch a video and I won't bother commenting. I, I just can't be bothered doing it. And, but there, there is, like a part, sometimes a part of me will want to do it. Okay, and I'll, and I'll want to see what other people think. But there are a lot of people who will troll. And this is, this is them seeking attention. Okay, they're trying to get a reaction. Can and they'll do this to you in the real world. They'll do it to you online faster. I, I would like to point something out. Because I basically have the impression based on the fact that one day... Not having thought about the flat earth for, you know, since they mentioned in school that back in the day, some people believed the planet was flat. Suddenly I had five, I, I kid you not, five recommended videos about the flat earth. Now, it's not like I'd ever clicked on a flat earth video before because I hadn't even thought about it. There were five of these, and this suggests to me that there was a push by someone with money to bring this into being as a thing. So right off the get-go, I suggest that maybe that a lot of these people who clearly don't believe it but are claiming to are paid to claim it. And that there are a lot of trolls out there that are paid to troll. Yes, but you can get paid in other ways. You can I'm get sorry. paid. You can you could get paid financially, or you could get a reward by having people believe you. And no, 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 I, no. I agree. I agree. That's a possibility. She, she's talking about people who are are contracted to do what they do. The way they yeah. do no it. doubt, no doubt. There is uh, so many of these. Um, there are so many people on the internet who have been who are controlled. They're being paid to do it, and and the conclusion that I've come to, and, and I truly believe this, is that we are being demoralized. And this is not just with the flat Earth thing. This is with the fake history thing and the Tartarian civilization. This magnificent civilization that everything and had everything and that we destroyed okay we are we we are monsters because we destroyed this tartarian civilization now tartarian civilization there is no evidence that it ever existed the way that people are saying it did but there is plenty of historical evidence to say that there was a group of people in um, siberia and and eastern russia who uh, went under the name tartar and they were like a, sort of the Mongol. They were people who rode horses everywhere. They were nomadic people. I'm and not, they did have. Go ahead, go ahead, Gandalf. I'm not exactly familiar with the uh, Tartaria thing. Uh, I've seen it around, but I'm not exactly sure what it is. Um, I, I'm sorry if you guys already went over this. 
It's like there's a whole community of people who believe that um, there was a civilization that spanned most of the world, and it was the Aryan civilization, and they are attributing all of the Greco-Roman archaeology to this civilization, and that our civilization somehow wiped it out to take control of the planet, and we we killed all the adults and we spread all the children all over the world, and this happened in the in the 1850s. Oh, and God. war happened in the 1850s, and they used mud to to, to bury all their cities. And uh, it, it is a it is a big fantasy. But the the main takeaway from it is that people who have all their lives studied history or believe that they understood, uh, you know, our history in a partial way, have are being suddenly they have to bring that into question. And it's like a demoralization that everything that we ever knew was a lie. Mm -hmm. Okay, the, the earth, oh, the earth could be flat. Um, history could all be bullshit. A thousand years could have been added to it. Um, and on and on and on. Yeah. Uh, well, you know, people invented slavery. Hang on, and hang on, hang on. Before we get too far off of the, the topic of, of trolls, I, I wanted to say something. Uh, my friend in the chat, Ray of Creation, is um, he made a comment that I wanted to throw at you, and I think is a very valuable and worthy point to be made here. He said sometimes troll, um, tr sometimes it's not a bad thing to have a, a, to in be engaged by a troll, or sometimes trolling is not a bad thing. Um, he says sometimes trolling is a means to cut through bullshit, and it can be funny when it's not outright malicious. I would even suggest that having trolls that we all have to put up with and deal with and occasionally engage with is, a, is also a way of actually helping us to grow in a way because it's, it's, a, it's almost a way of toughening up our skin, our metaphorical skin. Do you know what I mean? Yeah, I can't argue with any of that. That, that all makes perfect sense. I don't think we're talking about that sort of trolling, though, um, in, especially in an antisocial way. There is good trolling. I, I mean, I have seen, you know, people woke. That they, they have woken up because that their mind has been hit, and this is a, it's a, it's like a psychological technique, where you can actually break through someone's thinking, or break into someone's thinking, and you can do it by trolling them. You can and and getting a reaction that not only causes them to have an emotional response but they think at the same time bad trolling is just called just an emotional response there's no thinking it's just an attack even i would suggest even an individual who is narcissistically trolling for the pure pleasure of just you know renting space in your head and occupying gobbling up your time and, and someone who's just attention seeking for the person on the other end, the normal person who's trying to deal with or engage someone like that, I think it still has use. There's still a usefulness. And again, my, my friend Ray of Creation, Josh, says, only through struggle you receive growth. And I, I have to agree with that. So in a sense, I just, I, there's, there's, you know, there's always a, a, there's always a, a positive to every negative. Do you know what I mean? I will say that I really enjoy dealing with some of the trolls. You know, I, it's it's a pleasure to be able to put out data that countermands them. And I think the reader of the comments and whatnot will get more out of what I'm saying than what the troll is saying. So there's that. Knowing that we're all engaging in a public, uh, a public space, I'm pretty sure that most people, including you, Amy, I would say, when you engage with someone who's trolling you or, or, or just simply giving you a hard time or, or maybe just flat out being offensive and, and as we covered earlier where we, we, our egos are, are in, go into defense mode because we've been insulted in public, that... By responding to these people, we know full well that our response will be seen by the rest of the general public. Yes. So we may not be. It's almost like engaging in a debate, in, in a de debate, or even um, like a formal debate. In any formal debate, 
the debaters never intend to actually change the mind of their interlocutor. It's always about engaging the mind of the listening public. Exactly. Um, I will say that, that I, I actually do seriously enjoy <laughs> the well, if, if you if you enjoy it, then have fun. Do, you do you, man. Um, Daniel, you brought up a really interesting point just a a few minutes ago now, where you were saying that a lot of these bizarre out there conspiracy theories, like the Tartaria thing, um, flat Earth and what have you, that they're there to demoralize people. Um, I think that's a really great point, man. Honestly. Um, I agree with that because uh, I myself have been demoralized slightly by some of these theor uh, more out there conspiracy theories. And to see them get traction with large numbers of people is, you know, it's, it is it is demoralizing. I think that's, I think you're right. That is the point. But it's not just demoralizing for you, the person who sees uh, people fall for that conspiracy, that ridiculous conspiracy theory. It's demoralizing for the people who fall for it as well. And it's basically, I see it as a huge distraction from our, our reality. And these are tangents that we can go down, which prevent us from actually focusing on the reality of what's happening now. I, I, I have to agree with that, definitely. So I'm certain that flat earth is is a distraction to keep us arguing back and forth. And I think there are people paid on both sides of that to keep it going. I don't think it would be a thing at this point if there weren't people saying the earth is flat. No, it's not. Yes, it is. No, it's not. Back and forth and back and forth on and on ad infinitum. Yeah, and meanwhile, we keep electing politicians who we know are corrupt or corrupt. Oh, wait a minute. We don't elect them. Understand this. Our governments are corporations, and there isn't a corporation on this planet that will say, hey, let's just let Joe Public choose our officers. Not a one. But they well, will we they maintain the illusion that we have any say. Meanwhile, they just put in who they want to do their bidding. So don't blame us, <laughs> except for the fact that we're not realizing that, hey, we aren't involved in this. Well, the thing is, uh, the, the way that I see how they do it is the like Alex Jones will use elements of truth and then go completely sideways. Um, when it comes to the flat earth, they'll use elements of truth where uh, NASA has done some sketchy things in the past. Um, with the Tartaria thing, there are elements of truth that at some point in ancient history, there was a worldwide civilization or at least um, a collective of civilizations that had contact with each other but then they'll go in a completely crazy direction. So I, I think that they have to use some elements of truth in order to string along uh, the easily manipulated people that we have here online. Yeah, as a rule of thumb, what I used to guide me is those, those ideas that seem to be stomped on immediately and not taken up by anybody and, mo and most quickly ridiculed tend to be the ones that I look at more closely. And Gandalf, you're right. There, there was, at some point, there was a global civilization that sailed the seas and the world was connected. There are linguistic proofs of this. Well, Dan, uh, well, Dan are, you from, uh, are you from Australia? Yeah, I'm in Australia. Do you know that the oldest remnants of human beings in the Americas dates to around 50,000 years? Now, this isn't um, some kind of obscure YouTube video. This is actual documented, like their skull fragments. There's actually an intact skull of the first uh, human that came to the Americas, and it was over 50,000 years ago. Uh, and the remains were found in north, uh, northeastern Brazil, 
uh, south of the Amazon rainforest. Kind of, like Brazil's not a complete Amazon; it's not all jungle. Uh, the southern areas of the country are actually savanna and more temperate regions. But up in the savanna was actually discovered a human skull that's actually been facially reconstructed. And it dates, carbon dated, it's stated to 50,000 years ago. And would you believe uh, the race of the person that was discovered was uh, an Australian Aboriginal? Yeah, I, I totally believe that. I, I get that. There is uh, connections with the Pacific Northwest. There's the, the, the DNA that we're told. And there are... There are uh, companies that will uh, do testing and they won't corrupt them, but they have found that Australian Aboriginal DNA or the, the haplogroup did go to the Americas as well as come to Australia. And it probably happened at about the same time they suspect, but it was just like three months ago that they, they dated a skull that they had found a homo erectus, homo sapien skull that they'd found in uh, Greece, they were able to date it back to 200,000 years. Now, we're told that this present wave of humanity, um, Homo sapiens, came out of Africa 80,000 years ago. So when you've got a, a European, when you've got a skull in Europe that's 200,000 years, it kind of turns that theory on its head. But we're going back a long way now. I think we're going back so far that the, the mists of time kind of prevent us from making any real sense of it. But we do have, there, there is evidence that before the Europeans crossed the Atlantic, before the Romans, uh, the, that Egyptians reached New Zealand. Okay, there's very strong evidence that an Egyptian flotilla reached New Zealand. And the way we know this is because there are written records that such an expedition was sent out. And there are, it's, it's a species of rat that found its way to New Zealand before it went to anywhere else in the Pacific. And it comes from Indonesia. And so they can basically track the, that this, um, uh, this fleet apparently made its way to, say, Chile and decided that they couldn't get get around or whatever, and then they, they turned around, came back and settled in Hawaii. And uh, there, this is, there is a, a YouTube channel, and it's Gabby Plum. She's made a series of videos on the origins of the New Zealanders, the, the, the Maori people. And the Maori people, we're told, arrived from Polynesia about 800 years ago in New Zealand. But Which was only 500 lost. years before the British. Sorry? Which was only around 500 years before the British first arrived. That's right. So, but in making that in making that the, the official timeline, it excludes anything before it. Now, she will prove to us in her videos that they, they found mittens that are beneath volcanic layers that occurred 2000 years ago. People were living in New Zealand for thousands of years. And the Maori people themselves have oral traditions um, which were recorded, have been recorded, but always hidden, um, that there were people living in New Zealand before they arrived, and they were white people. And there were, Kel there were Celts in New Zealand before. That's really interesting because I've heard a similar stories that come out of Hawaii of when the Polynesians first arrived, they claim that there were white people that were the people that built the stone monuments that you can find in Hawaii. And yeah. 
they even claimed there was another uh, more um, stunted pygmy type people that also lived in Hawaii at the time. You know, it, ancient history is really fascinating because before, I'd say 20 years ago, there really was no substantiated evidence that could 100% be like the like the smoking gun that more sophisticated humans existed in the ancient past than, you know, the mainline archaeologists were willing to admit because for if you were to open up a, a history textbook, I got a few of them that date back to the mid 80s. And they always would claim that the earliest uh, types of sophisticated humans came out of Samaria in around four or five thousand BC at the latest. But once Gobekli Tepe was discovered, that kind of blew the entire narrative that humans weren't sophisticated around 12,000 years ago. The exact same time that Plato claimed and Solon claimed that Atlantis existed. Yep. So there used to be no proof. There was no proof that humans were sophisticated in the ancient past. It was all just a bunch of crazy conspiracy theorists talking about it. And even saying this now, I'm certain people don't listening um, maybe would watch this in five years, would have no idea what the exactly that they is, and they would just go, oh, no, that, that doesn't exist because that's not what I was taught in uh, school back in the 1930s or 20s or the 1980s you know people weren't taught this stuff uh gobegli tepe is like a gift for us because they cannot hide the fact that that thing was a that built at around 10,000 bc and you look at the sophistication and the effort that went into building that that was not built by groups of hunter gatherers that was built by a sophisticated people who who had resources and, and had structure and control. And they were able to work that stone, move that stone, and then for some reason they buried it uh, under rubble. And thank God they did, because had they not done that, uh, that site may have been destroyed, it may have been located um, by the church and then hidden from us. But we yeah. got very lucky well, and somebody funny. That's a great point. Like, look what happened to the aqueducts that the Romans built um, 1,800 years ago. The Romans built these amazing aqueducts that stretched all over Europe. And around 80 to 90% of them were completely dismantled brick by brick to build uh, shanty houses and to build castle walls. So no way in hell Gobekli Tepe, uh, even a piece of it, would still be intact uh, 12,000 years later if they didn't bury it. So it's it's like manna from heaven that any of it still exists. So this makes you think now, doesn't it? Someone had the foresight to bury that thing for us. I disagree. <laughs> Me and group have already talked about this. I, but... I, I'm, of, I'm of the opinion that it was not buried on purpose. Oh, I'm convinced it was. Uh, I, yeah, think I, I I tend to I tend to uh, be behind Aaron uh, Rufus's. I can't. Yeah. Okay, first of all, I can't imagine why they would do it, and second of all, think of the logistics of actually covering up the entire city, and why would they do it? And in order to in order to complete a construction project of that nature, even though you're just gathering rubble and walking over with your basket of rocks and dirt and dumping it and going back for another one. You have to live somewhere while you do it. So what were they living? They had this whole city made of stone and structures and their houses. And what? They they what? Lived out in under the stars while they completed this weeks or months or possibly years long construction project to bury it. And they had to live somewhere while they did it. So, I mean, the logistics of doing it baffles me. How, how is that incongruent with the fact that they built the place they built it in the first place. The actual construction of Gobegli Tepe as an uh, archaeological site, they have found no evidence that people were living there, but that doesn't mean it doesn't exist. Well, of course. Well, you got to think about it like this. Stonehenge is a very similar type uh, structure. 
and it was only about five or ten years ago i think five years ago that they actually discovered the remains of a village that was not even too far away now you got to think like this is my reasoning um how much of our civilization would really be left in ten thousand years like you you see um these monuments that we erect in the center of our towns kind of near courthouses the that would probably survive some of these structures these stone monuments like these obelisks that we erect that would probably survive but most I, of our most of our cities would would literally rot and corrode and disappear Cer yeah, certain <laughs> elements of our cities like glass would stick around so there would be tons and tons of glass to be found that would be one thing but when it comes to gobekli tepe i i'm convinced that probably 90 percent of what was around that area was made out of what we still over twelve thousand years build out of which is wood which could rot away theoretically in 20 30 years sure so there was probably large villages uh, mud mud brick houses you know, I'm not saying the people that built Gobekli Tepe were extremely, extremely sophisticated. I think that they were really uh, intelligent. They were probably just as smart as we are. So they probably built with wood. And they had some type of foresight. We have no idea what was coming. You know, it could have been, you know, strange weather patterns started occurring and they had some kind of foresight to bury the structure. There could have been rumors of some giant army moving from God knows where to burn and take down their civilization. Uh, yeah, they, they could have, that's right. They could have been a religious, a shift in religious thought. And, it could have been, um, yeah, I don't know, but I'm wondering, Rufus, how do you think it was, if it was natural, if that naturally happened, how did that happen without destroying the entire site? How did all of those rocks land on that site without completely demolishing the site? Because they are unearthing these rocks and they're still standing, many of them. Some of well, them are, when you say they're still standing, you're talking about the me megalithic T-type, T-shaped structures and so what natural what natural disaster happened that piled all of these rocks on top of this site what where how did that possibly happen how could that happen i mean i can understand an earthquake but this thing is on the top of a hill this is tepe means hill mm -hmm. this this whole site is on the top of a hill well what wait a minute hang on I, I know that they say tepe means hill and they mean go back to tepe means pot-bellied hill is that that's in Turkey? Is that right? That site Gobekli Tepe was in. It's in Turkey. Is that right? Yeah, it's, it's very close to Syria. Okay, so yeah. so when they say Gobekli Tepe means pot-bellied hill, are we talking the Turkish language? Correct. Yeah. Okay, because Tepe in Egyptian means age, right? So the Zep Tepe in Egypt means the golden age. Yeah, it's not in Egypt. No, I, okay, I, I'm just I'm just noticing the you know the the similarity in the wording. Um, it, this is my personal theory, and call it crazy, call it conspiracy, whatever. I'm sure you got a few of my ideas that you'll call that. <laughs> <laughs> Me too. Oh, oh, by the way, by the way, Gandalf, uh, Richard Richard Serrett, he he uploaded another short clip of a reverse speech uh, of uh, the Patterson. Um, interview what's so, the con what's the conclusion i did i haven't watched it yet i just noticed it in my subscription feed and just i just want to throw that at you in, in case you want to go check it out and i know you know who richard serrett is so oh yeah man i'll check that out so um <clears throat> all right uh daniel are you at all familiar with the thunderbolts project emmanuel the work of Eva emmanuel velikovsky at all i might be I can't recall. Okay, I'll, I'll, I'll be I'll be as brief as possible. It's this idea that these planets were much closer to Earth. Venus and Mars had a close encounter. There was an enormous electrical discharge, and through this massive, massive lightning bolt between these two planets, when their close encounter occurred, that there was what we call electrical machining of the planet's surface, 
of both planets. So uh, once that happened, all that, was, all that material was ejected into space and literally rained down on Earth. Think of the biblical fi uh, fire and brimstone story. Um, so that, that it's just a it's just a hypothesis of mine because quite literally I, I I'm a logistics man my brain thinks very very conclusively in terms of, of logistics as a contractor I'm always thinking about how to complete a project from start to finish what tools am I going to need what am I going to need to do what's going to be in my way how do I overcome this um, solving all kinds of problems in a logistical sense. So when I think of Gobekli Tepe, when, and they tell me that it was buried on purpose, considering the massive scale and size of the site, and by the way, have you heard they found a sister city? I mean, I just heard this like today or yesterday. There's, there's dozens of structures in that area. Yeah. Yeah. But well, what, what, not just you? dozens of structures. That I think, that I, if I'm not mistaken, they found a sister city. Well, Roof, um, you know, my reasoning behind why they would bury Gobekli Tepe is simple. Logically thinking, if we our civilization had some kind of knowledge that something bad was going to go down, we would probably lose everything. We were going to be knocked back to the pre-Stone Age, uh, which I'm imagining the people who constructed Gobekli Tepe had the idea of. What would we try and preserve, and how would we try and preserve it? I imagine some of the most famous structures um, that we could preserve would be, well, this is a bad example in modern times concerning what happened this year, but uh, I imagine one of the main things we would try and preserve, for example, would be the Notre Dame Cathedral. And we would probably cover that fucker in sand and dirt so that it would survive the cataclysm that was coming. 10,000 years later, all of Paris is gone. They dig out the, the, the sand that is covering Notre Dame, and they would go, wow, why the fuck did these people cover this thing up? I, I think that the Bukli Tepe was extremely important to these people, it had some kind of significance that we can't probably even comprehend, but it was probably some type of religious significance. You know what I mean? Extremely I, precious. If I, they, I can they, see that. I can see that. Yeah, that makes sense to me too. That actually does make sense. It, but it must have been very precious. And, and the, yes, they must have had some knowledge or forewarning that something was going to happen. But you can always argue that you know, such knowledge would have you focusing on getting the, getting yourself underground or safe. That's and your right. Livestock, and you wouldn't spend, you know, months or years burying unless you had a lot of warning. And I can't imagine how, you know, things we can't imagine about our prehistory. Yeah, well, we'll we'll never probably know exactly what went down, but you know, Gobekli Tepe, I think, is probably the most significant archaeological find of the past three or four or five centuries. I think it's more significant than Troy. I think it's the most significant archaeological discovery probably in human history, more significant than even the pyramids. And no, I think so. I think you're right. It, it calls into question the official timeline of when we started farming because yep. there must have been farms okay and but there was a city they found a city 7000 bc in israel and they didn't know how old it was it was there for a long time and then they wanted to build over over it i don't know the name of it but um it was recently uncovered and it's a walled city and it probably had 10,000 people in it or more. And this thing is dated back um, 7,000 BC, which takes us to 9,000 years ago. In Where was the city located? Israel. Israel. Okay. I, I believe it. Look, um, I'll give you the details later because all I need to do is go back to my history. And I will find and, and the, the video that brought it to my attention. And then I'll be able to... Um, send you links to the to well the... I remember I remember 
you know, going to the Royal Ontario Museum back when I was a teenager, and I was fascinated by an exhibit that they were displaying there at the time, which was of a walled city that existed in modern Ukraine, and it dated to 5000 BC. So that's exactly the same time as this city. So this city actually existed in Ukraine. Even according to established archaeology, it, it really did exist in modern Ukraine. This is thousands of years before the Scythians even existed. And yeah. they, they went from cities to back to nomadic, a nomadic lifestyle, which is fascinating. Well, there's um, Dark Age is a constant... This is a constant cycle that we, we've come across in history where we reach a peak in civilization and then some climate change or natural disaster or, or it's usually climate change. So one group of people have to go on the offensive to survive and they'll bring down other civilizations when they did it. The, um, the, the, the boat, well, the sea people um, who brought down um, the... Egypt, they brought down Egypt, Assyria. I think Assyria may have survived, but the Hittites. Yeah, um, the, the, yeah, the Sea People are an unknown group of people that came out of no nobody even knows to this day where they came from. They took out the uh, the Mycenaeans, they took out the Hittites, uh, the Mitanni Empire that was in northern Iraq, uh, and, and the Egyptian. Well, the only civilization that actually survived was the Egyptians. Because well, the only the only civilization that recovered was the yeah, Egyptians they, with they, the his, they, knowledge of their history. Yeah, they defeated the um, the Sea People on. I think it was like in the rivers of Egypt. So they actually went at them in their own, with their own game. Most of the other empires were trying to fight them on land because. You know, you'd think sea peoples, okay, they're going to be bad on land, so let's fight them on land. But no, the Egyptians defeated them, luckily, and they scattered, you know. But that, that's that's a great point. How many different dark ages has there been? Like, I think that initiated what in Greek history was known as the Greek Dark Age, where from the Mycenaeans and the 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 era of troy and uh, early sparta and you know agamemnon there was this giant giant dark age that happened in greece where it was only hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of years later that we got what people when they think about ancient greece we refer to as like uh the time of like aristotle and all that but that was like a recovery after 500 years from the dark ages that yeah came. and they were different they were different people who spoke a different language they, they understand linear a but we we can't make any sense out of the linear b and it's written in the same style but it's a different language and and we know that that was the language they were using for the trojan war okay and this is where max drives me nuts he, he he's bringing that attack on Troy up to recent history. He's saying it's all part of the same war. All these great battles in history happened at around the same time. And I'm like smacking my head listen, listening to him. Because I know he's an intelligent person, but um, Eric Schliemann found the city of Troy. And initially, it may not have been the Troy that was written about in the, the Iliad, but um, they kept digging and they found Troy, one, two, three, four, five, they kept building the city on top and they finally found at the bottom the Troy that was sacked and burnt and it was huge and it was part of a, a civilization in the Near East that existed and the time is, you know, 1100 BC. So perfect timing and so Homer's stories, whoever Homer was, whether he was one man or many, his stories on that Trojan War turned out to be more than myth. And mythologies are turning out that there is archaeological evidence to support in one way or another most of the myths and legends that we have that have been dismissed by science and history for so long. And the fact that there was a seafaring global civilization 
and a common language um, is indisputable that um, the the Magia language it was a root language for the Australian Aborigines, hmm. it was a root language for the Aztecs, uh, it was a root language for uh, uh, other Polynesian languages, uh, Japanese, and maybe Korean. Well, according to the official narrative when it comes to the, I always call them the My Gears, was they came out from the East. So it's it's theoretical that they could have had some kind of root language that dates back to, that connects all the Asian languages, similar to uh, the Indo-European language that stretches from uh, Scotland all the way to India. Well, it's it was a Hungarian Attila Flink who discovered that not it not it wasn't so great on the mainland of Australia, but he went to Tasmania, and their language had pretty much just evolved from what it was in the beginning without inf outside influence. And he discovered that he could communicate with the Tasmanian Aborigines using Hungarian and that many, many words, sentence structures were the same. And other work has been done since with other languages um, around the world. And they found that this connection exists. And this is where our civilization sort of points back towards the Black Sea and maybe the, the flood the flood story, the um, of of you know the Abrahamic religions and the Sumerians, maybe that flood was the Black Sea filling up full of water. Yes, yeah, it's quite possible. Agenda. Yeah, and so because you know Hungary is on the Black Sea, and these people uh, had a civilization, and when when civilization collapses, and we know this from um, when Rome fell, you, we have a dark age and people get on, go on the move. But climate change does this too. So the Sahara was lush and green and they're only admitting this now that it was lush and green. 5,000 years ago, there were lakes in the Sahara and all across Central Europe. And I, I think it was Central Europe was where there was a civilization which had spread out and they were forced to go on the move because of climate change. And they ultimately pushed into Europe, as we know it, the peninsula of Western Asia that is called Europe. They were moved into that area, forcing all the people in front of them down into Southern Europe, which ultimately brought down the Roman Empire. In the beginning, it made it strong because they had to defend it. And, you know, they had their initial expansion. They, they went, they threw down on the, the um, Carthaginians for their right to travel the, the Mediterranean and they won that battle. And they did it out of pure ingenuity, having never, apparently never been um, sailors before, were able to build a fleet well, isn't it? Carthaginians have it destroyed and then rebuild another one to beat them. <laughs> yeah, well, isn't it fascinating how, you know, how powerful was the Roman Republic, like, back during the days of, like, Marius, right? Um, you know, they were able, you know, the, the barbarian invasions that were started and triggered by the Huns coming in from the east that pushed over all the barbarian tribes into Roman territory. If that was something that happened during the time of Marius, so during the late Republic, oh my god, uh, they would have kicked the, the Franks' ass, they would have kicked the Goths' ass, they would have kicked the Alemanni's ass, they would have, they would have gone to town and wiped out, decimated, uh, these barbarian tribes that eventually were able to overthrow the Roman, uh, the Roman Empire, or at least in the West, right? Because, you know, back in the day, um, the Romans would go uh, 50,000 against uh, 80 or 90,000 Cimbrian German barbarians. Uh, they would take on uh, 10,000 men 
would take on 250,000 uh, British Celtic warriors, you know. Yeah, and, and win. Oh, yeah, and they slaughtered... Uh, they slaughtered Queen Boudicca's army. They slaughtered the Kimbri, like, but then hundreds of years pass, societies change, culture changes, and they were completely obliterated by 10,000 uh, Goths. Their birth rate declined dramatically. Men started dressing up like women, and, and basically the same things that are happening to our society now were all beginning to happen in the, the late Roman uh, Empire and the, yeah. the birth rate of the Germans was yeah. a, a, way higher than the birth rate of the, the Latins. So there was more of them. And then they started to um, contract them as their armies and bring them into Rome. And then they were demanding more and more you know, rights and before they knew it, they, they were overrun by um, a, a, a civilization that itself was forced out of its homeland by a civilization that was moving from the east. So how many times this has happened, we'll never know. But I wonder, what do you guys think? Where did the Romans come from? I had a theory on this. Um, I don't know how they were well held up under scrutiny, but... Where do you think the Romans came from? Weren't, weren't they uh, the Etru they came from the Etruscan? That's like according to the Aeneid, which was basically just propaganda created for the emperor or first citizen Augustus or Octavian. Yeah, basically. I I, I have no idea. <laughs> to be I, I think I think the Latins were um, or the city of Rome was kind of similar to what they said it was in the early days like the propaganda that the uh city of rome was founded by the trojans was i think just kind of made up in the early days uh the romans actually recorded that basically the city of rome was just a collection of villages established by you know random poor people that had no way to go they were outlaws and they were all men this is the story yeah yeah all men. And then they invited a neighbor, a neighboring town to come have a, a, a party. The same and tribe. Stole all their women. And, and then, but then when, the, um, when their neighbors got organized to come and steal the women or come and retrieve their women, their women had fallen in love with their new husbands and they stopped the fight and said, no, we want to stay. We'll, you know, we'll be Romans now. I mean, that's, this is what, the Romans saved their own history. The, the Aeneid, um, there may be a little bit of truth, but I don't think they came from Troy. I think linguistically, um, Latin is very closely related to Greek, the Greek that was spoken by the Spartans. And now we're told that the, the, the Romans were very enamorous of, they, they, they were Grecophiles, and that at some point they ended up, the elite of Rome were speaking Greek to each other and writing everything down in Greek. And none of this makes sense to me. What makes more sense is that um, a group of people moved out of the Peloponnesus into and we know that the Greeks were colonizing all of the Mediterranean, as were the Phoenicians. The Phoenicians were doing it in a less, um, uh, they were not as organized, whereas the Greeks were more so organized, even though they, they fought each other a lot. They were building settlements, you know, all around the, especially the Northern uh, Mediterranean and the Black Sea. and. I do not see why the Romans seem to appear uh, as the Etruscans and the Greeks blended in uh, around Rome. And I think that the Romans were basically the hybrid vigor of Etruscan civilization and Greek civilization coming together and uh, with a new you know, agenda, basically. And 
involved in the, and they started out with the Republic and, and well, it, they were probably influenced. I would say that's probably true to an extent where they were influenced probably by the Greeks and the Etruscans. You know, how many uh, Roman kings in the beginning were actually Etruscans? That all, they... all, all of the um, all of the early queen, uh, kings were uh, were Etruscan nobility. Yeah. So, and, but then they, the um, the population that was moving into the area. <laughs> Had had enough of this. They, they didn't want. Uh, well, to be ruled the by the kings. Are you familiar with the story that triggered um, the formation of the Roman Republic from where they were, you know, servile to the Etruscans, and they had a local uh, Etruscan nobility family that actually ruled over them, the Tarquin family, and. The story of how the Roman uh, Roman Republic was founded is really fascinating. If you like, look into it. Ba basically, I won't uh, waste your guys' time, but more or less, what happened was there was the prince of the city, his father, the king. Uh, he was a real um, he was a real ladies' man that used to really kind of seduce and hit on a lot of women in the city. And what happened was. There was one woman in the city that would always brush off his advances, and her husband uh, had to go off to war one day to fight a, a neighboring tribe that was uh, pestering like the farmlands that Rome controlled, and this, this kind of spoiled brat actually went to the woman whose name was Lucretia, and he, while well, the husband was gone, raped her, and... The husband came back and he found, this was like a few days later, the husband came back and found out that his wife had committed suicide. And Lucretia committed suicide because she had, there was so much shame. She was such a, she was like the perfect, uh, if you were like in the alt-right, she was like the perfect waifu, um, noble woman who would never sleep around with another guy. Like, and she killed herself because she didn't want to bear the shame of telling her husband Brutus that she was raped by another man and by the prince of the city, uh, no less. So once Brutus came back and found this out, uh, he he was in a in a rage, and because she was a very well known woman, how great she was, blah blah blah. The city went wild, and they chased the Tarquin dynasty out of Rome in uh, over to Vey, where they kind of hid out, and that's where the Roman Republic was found. It was founded over a noble woman being raped, and the husband and the populace of Rome freaking out to defend her honor. They wanted to murder uh, the Tarquins. Yep, I have heard that story, but you just crystallized it. You know, I do believe that something like that probably did happen. And then the, the Republic was formed because they had enough of kings. But it wasn't long before they went back to having kings. And it was out of necessity. And we, know, we all know the story of Julius Caesar. He, he was forced to do what he had to do to survive. And it may, ended up making himself lifetime consul of Rome or whatever. And, but it was after, after Caesar, um, that came Augustus, and that was he was such a great emperor. The population it was like they reverted back, or the numbers um, got to a point where they were able to impose their will, and it's and it's very um, Spartan. In just in in my um, studies of history, uh, the the Romans are very closely related to the Spartans in in the um the empire the empire of rome even down to the the red cloaks that they were wearing and the the military um uh organization which gave them the ability to create that empire that discipline seemed to have come from sparta and i i have a feeling that that's that is where Rome, as we we know it, came from. It was basically a, an infusion of um, the Spartan or Peloponnesian discipline and people and language with the Etruscans, 
you what? ever seen you ever seen the movie 300 yeah you remember the part in the movie where leonidas says something about the athenians and he says they're a bunch of boy lovers do you, <laughs> do you remember that part of uh of 300 that he uh, where leonidas calls the athenians boy lovers yeah and but leonidas the, the spartans were the biggest boy lovers of them all oh my god so you know okay yeah, yeah the entire spartan society was based around uh man love like man, men were you know they would rise they would raise up a young 13 year old boy and they would teach them everything they know and they would also bang them in the ass yeah and yeah. you know that was it's pederasty yeah and if you look but the thing is if you look and actually the entire spartan race um the 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 dorian race of spartans that ruled over the local population there uh the helot slave that had to serve the spartans eventually became so numerous the majority of the spartan armies were made up of servile helot slaves that were promised their freedom if they were to fight for the spartan armies because the the spartan population and birth rate completely plummeted um in the 400s and that's when that's when athens started to overtake sparta finally but early rome early rome actually like I, I i just don't see that they could be related because the early romans um back during the time of the kings and the early republic they hated they hated the etruscans because they thought they saw them as a vile corrupted people that would drink wine at parties with their wife and they hated homosexuality and the spartans are the complete opposite the spartans were probably the gayest uh civilization that ever existed but yeah, well, you just, we have that the 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 greek greek people treated their women very poorly and etruscans treated their women equally this is from what we what we understand from what we know of history here guys i'll be right back you're right the um the the art that we get from early the early etruscans they their women were up there with the men, okay? And, but it's just, I can see, like, the people who would have left Greece too, you know, maybe they left for different reasons, but maybe they disagreed with the way society was going, and this happens all the time. I mean, you get the Mormons detach themselves from the rest of America because of things that they believed in. So, you know, maybe a group of people or groups of people were leaving the Peloponnesus because, you know, they they got sick of having to, to have sex with boys instead of women, and maybe women went with them because they were sick of being kept at home. And but a lot of that came back into it was not there in the early Republic, but when the um, empire was happening, pederasty returned in with vengeance and and the the role of women was um pretty much uh, reduced to the the role of a housewife again and it, language wise um what i understand of the etruscan language and i don't know this myself but uh, from people who um i trust who speak Slavic um, tell me that the Etruscan language, when because it was written in basically uh, Greek, they wrote it in Greek, and they got all this, these Etruscan carvings in in Greek writing, and they, and read them, and make sense out of them um, in Slavic, and so the Etruscans, I believe, were you know, maybe um, more Slavic than Latin, they were definitely absorbed by Rome. So, and, and you get this when two peoples come together, you get this 
it's called hybrid vigor. And there's this initial um, enthusiasm that um, creates a, a great people, at least in the beginning. They do amazing things. And I just, the discipline of the Romans, I, I, I just can't see how it manifest itself without some prior direction. And the only place in anywhere near Rome, which is basically just across the water, and we're not talking very far, is the Peloponnesus and the Spartans. So maybe, I don't know, I, I think the Latin is a fusion of um, basically a bastardized form of Greek fusing with um, the, a Slavic language. And that's how it looks to me. And I don't know all Greek and I don't know any Slavic, but um, the people who I know who do know Latin and Slavic and Greek tell me this. And so that's why, that's where I get this, this theory that the, um, the Romans were Greeks and well, a good part of them were, and there were Greek settlements all over the Mediterranean, but they were insular. And I think Rome was different. It, it absorbed the people around it, didn't push them out or hold them out. And in doing so, they, without knowing it perhaps, um, cr create the foundation for this new people who kept absorbing new peoples and they just kept going and going and going until they had the largest empire the world had ever seen. I agree. And, with, I agree with you. I think the Romans were <clears throat> definitely Greekophiles. You we can see it in the language. We can see it in their architecture. We can see it in their laws. And I was going to say this, but Church of Entropy said it in the chat before I could say it to you that there is a crossover between the gods. They're almost identical in the attributes of the gods. They, uh, they attributed God status to the same planets, the same attributes to the same gods. And so there's no doubt all of the mythologies that created the, the, the precursor or the, um, the proto-religions were all based on these, these mythologies of these planetary gods. The Romans yeah. were without a doubt Greekophiles. So the Greeks were in the beginning, the Greeks were contesting with the Phoenicians for control of the Mediterranean. And in the end, it was the, the Romans who won that battle. And the Phoenicians sort of faded into history. And if you believe Martin Liebke, the um, flat earth British, then they sort of became a, a black nobility and and then went sneakily about taking back control of Europe and and um, doing sneaky things. But uh, it's fascinating that the, the the origins of European history, and for us to be demoralised over it. I mean, the Vikings alone. I mean, where did they come from? And their technology, their boat building technology, was not unique to them. I mean, we're told it was, but it, it wasn't. They, they have found um, very similar stuff that goes back to 2,000 years or, or 2,500 years, 3,000 years ago that the, um, the Celtic people were using to cross the, the British Channel. And uh, Phoenicians, they, they, they could sail. And, uh, they were like... I doubt the Phoenicians made it to the Americas, um, as you know, and then we know that the Vikings did. But this is not something that history is focused on. History focuses on Columbus, a, an Italian paid by the Spanish to go and find India the other way. And if you believe the story, Columbus believed and up until the day he died, that he had found Asia. There was a, um, another Italian who was apparently the first to 
at foot on mainland uh, America gave it the name. Is it Amerigo? Vespucci um, America? Or Amerigo Vespucci. There, there you are. <laughs> Good on you. See, we keep Amy around for a reason. Yep, I'm here for a reason. <laughs> You're a wealth of knowledge. <laughs> she she fills in just in time. Yeah, yeah. You're our Google on demand. <laughs> oh dear, oh dear. Uh, I'm the duck duck go on command. <laughs> <clears throat> but before before the Romans, there was clearly civilization in Europe, and Gandalf's mentioned this before. Walled cities in where was it? In um, was it Bulgaria? I think he said. Hold on, my my ducking isn't doing well right now. <laughs> oh, that, oh, you're you're searching. Okay, you're not pulling this off the top of your head now. No, no, I I'm trying <laughs> to pull it off the top of my head, and it isn't coming. Oh, well, yeah, if you probably it. know something, if you want to, oh, wanted, oh it's Ukraine. Ukraine, that's it. Yeah, the Ukraine, this is, um, so basically, this is where, um, I mean, Alex Jones was telling his audience that Russia began in the Crimea and, um, and the Ukraine. And this simply isn't true. That there, there were, and we call them Tatars. This Tartarian civilization, which has been blown out of proportion, w were living in the Ukraine and they had cities and they farmed and they were there a long time before the Swedes came down and took control and created what we know as Russia. But Russia began in, in Moscow and two cities either side of it joined forces and then it was... They were. Uh, they had to defeat the Tartarians, who were a mixture of different nomadic hordes that roamed the steppes and farmed the steppes of Eastern Europe, and it was in that uh, coming together to do that that created the Russian people, the Russian language, and the Russian culture had nothing to do with Ukraine. It was beating Ukraine. And which is why when Alex says, oh, I must have read 300 history books or whatever, I'm like, that's too many because you've, you've um, you filled your brain up with so much contradicting stuff that now it's making up its own. And this is something I firmly believe is that rather than reading everything, just Reread the best, find the best. So maybe two dozen good histories in Europe and read them over and over and over again. I know I don't have a terrible memory, but I, neither do I have a photographic memory. And I'll read a book and it, I won't be able to remember, you know, 90% of it off the top of my head. But if I read it over and over and over again, that things begin to stick. And I, I, one of the series I really like, and anyone who watches the video and is interested in the history of civilization needs to go and look at Will Durant, his um, The Story of Civilization. It's an 11 volume um, series that begins with Egypt, Samaria, uh, Indus Valley, uh, and our Asian heritage, and then goes up through Western civilization. And I, I have read through that series maybe three times. I'm, I'm going at it again for a fourth. I don't read it in order. Um, the only one that I haven't read through completely is his um, on the and I really should, but it's the um, the Renaissance. But he does cover the time period in uh, in the in the books either side. He covers that time period. He just doesn't focus on the Renaissance. 
and in one specific book he focuses on the renaissance and there's too much information in there for me right now to and i don't have a lack of interest in the renaissance in learning more about it um, as compared to our origins in civilization and the civilization and the philosophy of europe and when i say philosophy i mean theological philosophy as well and the the play of you know forces like voltaire and that misanthropic genius um the dean of saint patrick's who had a recipe for cooking children he wrote gulliver's travels jonathan swift um uh, urukajina um or erugina depending on which book you read, the uh, Irish philosopher, um, the, the, the missing time that we have in Britain, um, where we're still arguing about whether there was a Saxon invasion or migration. Um, it's pretty clear that the language replaced whatever language was in Britain at the time was replaced by the Anglo-Saxon language. So I tend to, either they were severely outnumbered to the point where they had to take on the language of the people who came or they were beaten into submission. And the evidence sort of shows that they were kind of beaten into submission because there was waves of refugees pouring into Wales and Ireland at the time of, and and the and the Irish, they were the Scots, were forced out of Ireland into Scotland by the wave of people that was was crossing the the Irish Channel to escape this Saxon, uh, Anglo-Saxon Jew invasion from mainland Europe. So, and then that sort of began that phase of history, which has led us to where we are today, which is this Anglo-American world that we live in which is um, being challenged by China. And this sort of brings us full circle to the, the social engineering that's going on that is trying to demoralize Western civilization into believing that it deserves replacing. And I think um, the flat earth and the, the, the mud flood history and a score of other things are being used as tools to and, and they're just a part of the, the whole to demoralize i mean feminism had pretty much accomplished everything it needed to by the 90s in my opinion i i think that women were being seen as an equal to a man in every way um, professionally but not physically and men and women are two separate parts of one species. We, uh, speaking, speaking of that, I, I just recently watched a video that was discussing Ms. Monopoly, where if you're a female player, you get like $240 for passing go. But if you're a male player, you get whatever the standard is. I think it might have been. Anyway, you get more money for passing go if you're a female. Right. <laughs> and I'm like, what? Because they're, they're saying, oh, women are so oppressed in our society. We decided to make a game that gives them the advantage instead of the men. And it's like, wait a minute. <laughs> what? Look, I'm glad you can see that, Amy. But you can see where this has gone, where yes. feminists has gone way past the point of you yes. know suffrage to um e equality in and now there are, are women making youtube videos demanding that all males um be exterminated yes and, and because we are men are responsible for all the world's problems and the patriarchy is basically um just a, a, a cancer on society that is 
the evil caused everything evil to happen and and we know that this is it's like an artificial it's being imposed upon us yes yes i'm glad so you, i'm glad you guys things. brought it back to this because one of the videos that i wanted to share was i'm and i'm glad you brought up the 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 what is it miss monopoly thing That's, monopoly, yeah, yeah. I, I saw that going around too and it's funny because some people were wondering if hasbro was just trolling us and they have on occasion created various aspects of monopoly literally for that purpose just for fun um and they they were actually contacted and they said no this is actually not this is a, a serious endeavor and, and and you know socially what what this does is by putting women at an advantage in this let's be honest it's just a board game but by putting women at the advantage at the start of the game and throughout the game you're not actually empowering women because psychologically in the mind of the player if you're a woman you're not going to feel you're not going to correct me if i'm wrong but you're not going to feel as proud, you know, if you win the game or whatever, or if you're doing well in the game. You're not going to feel as as proud of yourself because basically you haven't really earned it through merit. Yes, <clears throat> exactly. You've been given a a uh, bonus that was is strictly based on the fact that you happen to have a certain physical configuration, which okay yeah i i agree it's... so there's this other video that i wanted to share about ben. about i don't know if you guys have seen it it's from this freaking youtube channel called um uh, now this news network where and it's just an opinion piece that they're putting out and you should see the comments, by the way. That's what I was laughing at earlier, Amy, when I was talking to you, right, like on the pre-show. Um, okay, so you said that you can't hear, and, and you don't like the way I have been screen sharing because you can't hear it in the Hangout, and you have to go to my channel and all that. So I'm going to go ahead and I'm going to do a screen share now on the Hangouts, and then I'm going to go and share this video. And I would like you guys' opinion, uh, particularly Daniel's opinion. This has to do with social engineering. Um, where did it go? I just had it right here. Uh, hmm. Where did it go? I lost my tab. Oh, here it is. It is this one. I didn't recognize it. Okay. This is from the uh, uh, Now This News. Uh, hopefully you guys can see it uh, on the... Uh, on the live on my channel now this news why you should stop saying hey guys okay so Amy let me know go ahead and speak up during the video if you can hear this um, I'm gonna play portions and I'll, I'll pause during as we go it's only four and a half minutes but I'll pause occasionally and we can comment on what's being promoted here in terms of social engineering and the uh, fourth wave or third wave feminism or whatever that is so here we go hey guys welcome back to now this Guys is a simple term. It could mean. Amy, can you hear that? I don't hear anything no, from. No, sorry, I, I was muted. Um, no, I can't hear anything. So I will have to go to your channel. To well, hear. actually, there's a uh, there's there's subtitles on the bottom. So I'll just go full screen, and if you want to just read as we go here, it's it's pretty damn ridiculous. Anyway, check this out. Hey guys, welcome back to Now This. <laughs> guys is a simple term. It could mean boys, or if you're modern, hip, it means people. At first glance, guys seems inviting, friendly, maybe warm, even comedic at times. But it, like many male default terms, should not be normalized as an all-encompassing phrase, oh, brother. innocent as it may seem. While we may understand the word means no real harm, with a deeper look, you'll understand that we've been ignoring the cognitive impact on women as well as gender non-conforming folks. All right. I have issue with almost every single thing that comes out of this woman's mouth. Yes. But, you know, in lieu of getting through this without taking an entire hour to... to 
I can see some. Do you want me to start over, Daniel? You're um. Yeah. Um. Oh, Daniel. By the way, if you're what, either mute your mic, or or mute the live. If if you're on my channel watching the live video, so we I haven't, I haven't so, seen any of it. So we don't get the yeah, feed, so we don't I get the feedback. So okay. either so I can't. Either, all right. All right. So just to prevent feedback, either mute your mic or mute the. Uh, He's mute, got it. Mute. You had it oh, muted. Okay. All right. So I'll start over. It's only a couple of seconds. Here we go. <laughs> hey guys, welcome back to Now This. <laughs> guys is a simple term. It could mean boys, or if you're modern, hip, it means people. At first glance, guys seems inviting, friendly, maybe warm, even comedic at times. But it, like many male default terms, should not be normalized as an all-encompassing phrase innocent as it may seem. While we may understand the word means no real harm, with a deeper look, you'll understand that we've been ignoring the cognitive impact on women as well as gender non-conforming folks. Okay, so I, I need to address this, where she says, while we may understand the word means no real harm, and yet she goes on to say, with a deeper look, you'll understand that we've been ignoring the cognitive impact on women as well as gender non-conforming folks. So I don't understand how she can make that leap when two seconds ago she just said, while we may understand the word means no real harm, it, se yeah. it seems like she's actually trying to make it make, ha have, have harm. some real harm, yes. Well, and it's sort of like when we talk about man and mankind. Hello? That includes the women. <laughs> sure. And before yeah. and before I forget, I also want to point out that on multiple occasions throughout my life, I have seen women use the term guys when referring to a whole room full of women. Yep. Okay. Yep. So I don't know where this chick is getting off or who wrote this fucking script or whatever. And here I go getting triggered again. I'm, I'm dropping F-bombs. But uh, Daniel, you got something to say? Yeah, yeah. The the cognitive impact is all hers. the The only cognitive impact that the word "guys" is having on women is in the context in which she is putting it. So there was none, and now there is. This is um, this is linguistic. Basically, this this is. Um, uh yeah okay she is creating th this movement is now creating um they're creating problems where there are none they're making issues out right. of non-issues yeah. yes the cognitive impact is on bringing this issue up in the first place mm. and yes like amy said this is mankind and when you say that you don't see all men Mankind is men and women. It's and this, mankind refers to all humans. That's right, yeah. and it should. And we shouldn't have to change our language to Be. Uh, prove that we're, we're not misogynistic. This is, okay. this is very 1984-esque. Politically where, correct. This is, goes back to the demoralization of our civilization that I was talking about. And um, I, I'm sure you've seen... The um, drag drag queens doing stories with children and oh yeah, story time. Oh yeah, rolling around on the floor with them and I mean demonic clown creatures, um, uh, trying to um, brainwash children into seeing gender differently to the way they would naturally see it. Now, like I was saying before. In the at least here in Australia, in the 90s, we had got to the, we were right at the end of racism. We were right at the end of homophobia. We were right at the end of racism. No, I said the racism. Um, it was all ending and people were going right. Well, clearly that is, um, is, a, is a not 
a constructive way to you know, run a society. So let's let's be inclusive, and let's not um, judge people upon you know their the decisions that they make with their lives. And it has gone beyond that now. It's like this thing has been um, put on steroids, so to speak, and it's done to demoralize. I believe to demoralize us. That it's it's uh, Winston down and shown four fingers and said, how many fingers am I holding up, Winston? Yes. And um, yeah. I see four. Okay. So and they, eventually Winston does say, okay, there's five. But, but that was not good. He said, no, no, no. So the only answer was, I don't know right. where he had to get to. It was you need to see how many fingers you're holding up. And this is what they're doing to us now. Gen there are two genders, and occasionally there is an intersex one with an ovary and a testicle. Okay, that's it. Yeah, uh, two genders, male, and that makes the human race. And now they're trying to tell us that there isn't two genders, there is however many they tell us there is. Yeah, it's not homosexual gender, it's not intersex, it's it LGBTQIP. Plus. And that plus could be whatever they say. And when they say it, we have to agree. And if we don't, we're homophobic misogynists who, who aren't human. And that's the direction in which we're heading. And all, um, all the independent thought is going out the window because everyone is going to be conscious of what they say and in order to do that, you must be conscious of what you think. And I hope that uh, people watch my video, Who's Responsible? Because in there, I point out that I am not responsible for how others choose to feel about what I say. They do have a choice. So I will say whatever I want. And if somebody doesn't like it, it's on them. And I hope yeah, hate speech. Hate speech is a is a weapon. It's against all of us. It's bogus. Oh, she even mentions weaponizing, and and I'll I'll get to that, and hopefully we can get through this without pausing and taking an entire hour. But but let me play another minute or two of this, and and I'll pause, and we can go over it. I'm, I'm glad that I'm subtitles because I can't hear. Her. Okay. Okay, and that, that's probably just because you're on the panel. Um, I'm pretty sure everybody in the live can hear it, and it should be broadcasting um, with sound. Yeah, it, it, it is broadcasting with sound. I checked. Okay. All right, so I'll play some more of this. As well as gender non-conforming folks by only explicitly addressing the male identifying individuals present. The meaning of guys has changed over time. According to the Washington Post, etymologists believe it began in the 17th century with a guy named Guy Fox. Okay, she goes through a little bit of the history and it has to do with people who align themselves with Guy Fox being called guys, blah, blah, blah. This is the boring part, so I'll, I'll skip ahead a bit here. Guys. Eventually, according to the Boston Globe, the term broadened to describe creepy people, then to a generic term for men, and now, some would say, a gender-neutral phrase. What do you mean, some would say? It is a gender-neutral phrase. I just expressed and I just told you, and I'll be damned if there's anybody who can deny that there are women who use the term guys to refer to all their girlfriends. Oh. Walk into a room full of women and say, "Hey guys, we got to go over here. We got to do. We're, we're going to play a board game now. Hey guys, we're going to do this. Hey guys, I got alcohol." Absolutely. Women Absolutely. use it to each other. It's just a, a colloquial term, and this is again just repeating myself and repeating what Daniel said that we're making an issue. This person or this channel, whoever has scripted and created this video, they're making an issue out of a non-issue. Yep. So she says, for decades, we have a set standard of only addressing. For decades, we have set a standard of only addressing the men in the room. Of no, 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 we haven't. We have not. Yeah, that, that is not true. Ladies and gentlemen, and ladies can always came first. Oh, that's right. Good point. Ladies and gentlemen, ladies is first. That's correct. 
Yep. Of course, we claim it's colloquial, but with our elevated knowledge and inclusive perspective. Elevated knowledge and inclusive perspective. Oh, I love where I captured her facial expression while well, on that pause. Look at that. Mm. That's <laughs> Classic. <laughs> <laughs> What that shows me is that she's not comfortable herself with what she's saying. Oh. She's actually confused herself. and, yeah. and it's she's reading the, the script. Well. <laughs> Good point. Good point. I, you know, I was just completely ignorant of her, her, her own body language because I'm too busy focusing on two or three things. But you're absolutely right. That facial expression says it all, that she doesn't even agree with this herself, that she's disgusted by having to read what she's oh. reading here. She's definitely not comfortable with it. She, she's. This is discomfort. This is. Yeah, she. She's not. This is not her. She. This speech that she's giving is not her mind. Someone has written it. Yeah. Or, or helped her write it and told her what to say. <laughs> you know, it's really hard to know though because there are. I'll people be right that, back. There are people that genuinely believe these things. They go along with whatever establishment narrative is being pushed in whatever given week. You know, yeah. when, um, you know, when, um, you know, the, the whole transsexual thing that happened maybe back in 2015, how it, it, it was like in the news out of nowhere. It, I forget what's uh, his name. Bruce Jenner uh, became a woman. And then. Everywhere in the news, you started hearing how we need to accept trans people. Uh, there was a there was a federally mandated law in the United States and and in Canada that trans people are allowed to go to whatever bathroom they choose. But this was uh, this was like a worldwide thing that spread to every Western country within the same same year that. Trans people are being um, persecuted. Uh, this is the new social movement of the year that we need to overcome this evil, you know, and it's, it, it just will never end. I don't think that it will ever end. I think that. Uh, the... I, I'm going to tell you that, that the whole trans movement is entirely manufactured. Oh, of course. Of course. Approx but, but approximately 0.003% of the human population is trans. Yeah, but now, I'm this, sorry. Is whole, this is the whole problem, Amy, that this is a manufactured um, controversy. Um, yes. there, there is that tiny, tiny percentile of people who are trans but if you actually look at the numbers from 2010 to 2019 that number has exploded i think that that number is nearly one percent to two percent now of people that claim to be transsexual mm. and that's because there was this massive massive push to normalize it and to advocate for it and people before that it was like okay that person thinks they're a woman okay i don't really give a damn but then in 2015 it became very established that you have to accept this new um and celebrate yeah yeah celebrate this celebrate new it yes yeah and you made a good point gandalf you raised a very good point about this big being global and Rufus asked me the other day, he said, why do you have such an interest in American politics? And I, my answer was, well, American politics is basically world politics. But really, what, what I'm seeing is you can tell when something has been, a directive has come down from on high, because you'll see that legislation or that movement will be happening in several different countries at the exact same time yeah. and in the exact same way and a, a very good in point here is right now our, our conservative party who's in charge in my state of New South Wales has actually trying to legalize abortion right up till birth and they're taking it out of the criminal code and making it all medical and they uh, have completely they want to completely decriminalize um, a woman who attempts to kill her own baby inside her and they want to allow, as long as two doctors agree, um, that a medical impact on the woman, that they can abort that baby right up until the, the final week of gestation. 
Yeah, and that's maybe exactly that the same um, thing is yeah. happening in the United States. In yeah. New York, yeah. Maybe yes. that is the next frontier. Um, you know, women are being oppressed because they can't um, abort their baby after it's been birthed. You know, who knows where they're going to go with this next time. That is, that is the direction. that and, yes. and that has been actually spoken of before. And it's been brought up. And there have been articles written by feminists and abortionists that say, well, we should be able to um, abort this child before it turns three. And that has trickled down <laughs> um, wow. because we know from a psychological perspective that um, cognition and awareness of self occurs between three and five and they're going to use that argument to say that if we um, abort this child before it turns three it wasn't a person and it just keeps going and going and wow yeah and, maybe, maybe, maybe. And, 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 and in the meantime they're lowering the age of sexual consent in some cases and down to 12 or 14. Yep. yep sounds, well, sounds like an excuse for uh human sacrifice well, it almost seems it almost seems that they it, are going it does, to. Amy. Well, yeah, no, I agree with that, Amy. But it almost seems mm -hmm. like they're going to try and. There's hundreds of different avenues they could go down, but it seems like they're going to try and continually look for new oppressed things that need to be overcome, to pacify the mob, that their rulers are not fucking them over at the top, that it's really. Uh, it's like this group or that group. It's some law here or there that's stopping true freedom from coming. And I just think these things are uh, ways to pacify uh, all these little social movements, all of them. Um, these things that need to be overcome. Oh, oh, we're being oppressed. We're living in the past. This, this, this kind of speech has kind of gone on for 20 years now. Bro, sl sl slavery is, is freedom and ignorance is strength and yeah war is peace war is peace there is a there is an agenda here and we are moving in a certain direction and this direction is and i'm sure you aware and anyone who watches your video is going to be aware that there is actually a movement to depopulate the planet and that there is a consensus amongst our elites that there are too many people on the planet and we're causing too much impact on the environment and we're going to this and that. Now, in order for them to, to um, depopulate the planet, if they want, first they need to, um, need to take the uh, our sanctity for life away from us. Okay, our they need to dehumanize humans yes. in a way that makes it um, makes us react with motion when huge amounts of people die people are committing suicide and well they in europe they you're allowed to go and kill yourself in europe for pretty much whatever reason you want and and they using all these techniques and we've been talking about them to demoralize in such a way and a weak mind or a mind that's a question of itself its identity is very um, to suggestion. And then you end up with um, teenagers who believe that all humanity is just a virus on the planet. I mean, that was, this has um, been said many times that humanity is just a virus. Yes. And, but you end up with teenagers who believe that we're just, and they become suicidal. And the suicide rate has just, it's not, it's not, um, but it's not it's not discussed in the media as it should be. But um, we are seeing suicide um, like we've never seen before, and only Japan has had similar suicide, and it's increasing there as well. And this is the tech, the technology that's disconnecting uh, young people from each other. Um, the demoralization of the sexuality. Um, you don't know how many sexes there are. The feminism out of control. Um, women who truly believe that men are responsible for 
<laughs> all the world's problems and believe that would be hey, what, exterminated. What do you think um, of this? What do you think of this, Daniel? Jay Walker brought up a good point, and it's something that I've thought about myself as as we cover these topics. Like last week, we covered the um, the cannibalism thing. And oh yeah, I'd love to spend five minutes on that with you. Um. Well, okay. I, I, I don't. I don't really want to step on my buddy's toes, and I'm pretty sure he's going to go live in about 20 minutes at 10 o'clock. So we're going to shut this down at 10. Um, okay. Yeah, we've got to make sure we uh, shut her down at 10. But um. Uh, yeah. So Dan, we got. So we got about 20 uh, minutes. Go ahead, finish Gandalf real quick. Oh, I would love it if you were to come over and stick around. Uh, I maybe leave a comment in the side chat. I'd love to subscribe to your channel. Um. Yeah, um, Gandalf, I'll get you his um, his channel. Um, Daniel, if you want to leave a comment in the side chat so other people can subscribe to you if they like. Um, also, if you want to, you can uh, drop a link. Or if you leave a comment, I'll give you a wrench. And then you can drop a link to your main channel, the one that you have 1,500 subscribers on. Um, oh, the one that's linked in, in my promos? Yeah, it, the, the one with the icon that's in the promo. But I want to throw this at you real quick. Jay Walker made a point. He said, don't you think that even debating this stuff is playing into their hands? Certainly not. Um, I left a comment to Jay, basically, in more or less that we're not debating this. I don't think what we're doing right here is debating. I think factually, ethically, morally, they're completely wrong. We've already won. There is no debate. These people are dead wrong. Speaking of, you, you know what? You're right, Gandalf. Look at this. Um, if you're on my live chat right now, or if you can see what I'm doing, I should be screen sharing. Oh, yeah, I am screen sharing on the Hangout, so you can at least see this. If you go to this video on their channel and you check the comments, the first thing you'll notice, let me, go, let me jump back up. The first thing you'll notice is that the, uh, the like and the dislike have been, have been uh, disengaged. <laughs> okay. Chicken. So Chicken. That, so that's first. And then if you go down and, and you look at the comments that these that have are left under this video, um, it's it's, <laughs> you know, I I knew this phrase would end up uh, being a butt hurt phrase to someone someday. Shaking my damn head. Ha! They disabled the like and li dislike count. Aha, uh -huh, I, I guess it's cool now to call someone it, and we haven't even gotten to that part yet. Yeah, really. LOL, they disabled the likes and dislikes. All right, you're getting deported. Hey, what's up? Uh, any Anyway, hey, guys, what's up? Some Somebody's just trolling a little bit. Um, what the fuck? Fem feminism gone way too far. Plus, what's up with the likes, dislikes being turned off? Um... There's a comment down here I wanted so much privilege. What a dickhead. See you turn the likes off. Um, let me see. This guy here says, this guy, G-E-R-G-E-R-W, he says, the term guys has been used inclusively for about 90 years. If you bother to do actual research and study etymology, instead of celebrating its inclusive nature, which it is, it, ha it has an absolute inclusive nature. When you walk into a room and say, hey, guys, that means everyone. We all know yep. this. Yep. You decide to add the division of the sexes by redefining it how you see fit. We've already covered that. Daniel pointed that out. Absolutely. Exactly saw, what it is. This guy says, I saw dislikes 10 to 20 times more than likes on this video yesterday, but now the information is no longer available. Why? Hmm. So, yeah, they just did this yesterday, I guess. Or, yeah, he left that comment 33 minutes ago. Um, so yeah, the dislikes were 10 to 20 times more than the likes on this video. So that, and that I, I rat scan through a big portion of the comment thread and that's, so you're right, Gandalf, we're winning this, this shit is, they're wrong. And we're simply pointing out that they're wrong. Yeah. That's why we're winning because we are here discussing and unpacking. Yes. And, and more and more people are becoming aware of. And you cannot defeat the truth. The truth is its own weapon, and it will win every time. And they, the, um, if anyone's really demoralized, it's them, because they haven't gotten everything their own way. And yeah. uh, the tide has turned, 
and um, I, I'm very reluctant to say that we're we're winning, but um, because you know what sort of um, things they have up their sleeve. But um, I, I do get a feeling that there's been a, a a real change, a real shift in the consciousness, and that uh, people are daily coming to terms and becoming aware of these weapons that are being used against us and the, the inconsistencies between what we're being shown on the, the you know, the, the television news compared to the reality of things. And you could use Donald Trump as an example and that the lies that they have spewed about him, whether he's good um, for us or not, he was not, he was certainly not expected to win that election. And um, whoever was in, whoever's in charge of the media in the United States was very, very unhappy about. I, I, I disagree. Whoever's in charge of the media, the media are owned by the same people that own the corporation, the United States of America. I think, and I think, yeah. And, I, it's, and I, it's all a play. I think a lot and of that was manufactured are, as well. Yes. Yeah, it's, I think you might, be, you might be right about that, but... Can, it was a very good production. The the, the Donald Trump oh, yeah. outrage, and I'm not and I'm not in favor of Donald Trump. Let me just make that clear. I'm not at all in favor of Donald Trump, but I think this over exaggerated hatred and and vitriol toward Trump is largely manufactured. He he's a lying scumbag, piece of crap, criminal, um, gang, Aren't they gang, all? gangster, just like the rest of them. So yes, yeah. So, I um, I don't think he was the gangster they wanted, though. And even if it was, even if the whole thing was in a production for us and our benefit, then they've really overplayed because just that anyone who watches what they show us on the news and then goes and sees what he actually said, they they become aware that there is now this inconsistency and they stop trusting the news media because we know that they lie. And yeah, it's, you know, when you look at American politics and our choices between um, a celebrity, a, a literally a reality TV celebrity, Donald Trump, criminal gangster, and Hillary fucking Clinton, if that's our choice between Donald Trump and Hillary Clinton, the only conclusion I can say is we're fucked. <laughs> yeah, yes. When I mean, you had John Kerry versus George Bush. Yeah. Like, okay. Point, the basically. same secret society. Oh, exactly. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Were, were, there it was. <laughs> it's 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 all a play. All right, let's it's let's all a play. Let's try to get through this, and maybe we can spare a few minutes if Daniel wants to talk about the cannibalism topic we covered last week. Oh. So okay, well, I do want to say that 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 uh, uh, you guys Evan, there are thirteen minutes until the thirteenth hour begins. Oh, okay. <laughs> on Friday the thirteenth, no less. Evan, Evan did want me to bring up the difference between ethics and morals. Um, if I'm, is that something I can do? Um, if, if, you, if you can do it really fast, can you wait? Can, can we try to get through this video? Yes, maybe yes. we'll get through that video and then we'll see. Um, if I can I'll tell you it. what, I'll bump up the speed on this video and I'll try not to stop it so many times, but it's going to be tough. All right, here we go. It just seems lazy, inconsiderate, and a small part of what reinforces the gender hierarchy today. How is one to feel empowered to speak or assert themselves when upon greeting they're misgendered or even ignored in language? Can we be surprised that for decades women often felt uncomfortable asserting their voice when we didn't even take the time to properly acknowledge them? These That's largely untrue, actually. In, <laughs> in, hi in history, especially in the home, and she covers this, um, my mother m made no bones about speaking up, and I guess you guys had mothers that were similar. Exactly. <laughs> okay, let's yes. move, let's. False premise. It's... The, the linguistic tendencies were developed and reinforced. These linguistic tendencies were developed and reinforced in eras where women were barely meant to be seen and certainly not heard. Please. A again, that's fucking bullshit. Yep. Please note. You're not a bad feminist if you're comfortable with using the phrase, guys. There are larger issues that we, the feminists, need to combat. Here we go. Stop right there. There are larger issues that we, the feminists, need to combat. Yeah, like how about, like how about, rights. like how about fucking cultures around the world that still require women to wear cloth bags? 
there are larger issues that we the feminists need to combat. Like how about entire countries and entire religions that allow their men to beat the crap out of their women for the crime of showing a little bit of ankle skin? Yeah, and, and here's another thing that's bringing people to the, the reality and truth of what's going on is that the champions of the LGBT QIP plus movement are the champions of the Islamic repopulation of uh, the United States and Europe. I mean, there is a huge um, inconsistency there that um, as people become aware of, you've got to ask the question, why? Why is is the, the worst kind of misogyny tolerated in one culture and then another culture? our culture where misogyny was disappearing and evaporating has suddenly we're all being beaten <laughs> head with a stick for it yep but it's not right there to combat reproductive rights rape culture violence against women lgbt reproductive rights. there it is violence against women now i'm not denying violence against women and, and i'm not i'm not poo-pooing the idea but the statistically if you're a man you're more likely to have violence against you. That's just a fact. Men die in war. Men die on the job in overwhelming numbers above and beyond women. And True. And in terms of general violence, men are more likely to have violence against them than women. That is almost... Yeah, this, uh, another um, problem that we're seeing now is women, or uh, girls, are starting to fight each other like men used to so there we have um, women who are behaving like men and i've seen some horrific videos where with women fighting each other and this didn't used to happen like now that. when you say women are you talking about high school because i wouldn't classify them as women they're still well, they're uh, still girls uh, i'm saying high school to their mothers getting involved and into the brawl as well okay well, if you've seen those videos, then I mean, I wouldn't be shocked if they're out there, but I know what you're talking about. There's a lot of videos out there with videos of, of girls fighting in school. I just want to try to clarify, get some clarity cat on fight. that. Remember it was a cat fight? It used to be very rare and it was a big thing when it happened. It, not anymore. It's happening all the time. Yeah, you know, you're right about that. It, it is happening more. Moving on. And the general reprogramming of most people's minds. When the general reprogramming of most people's minds. That's exactly what you're doing right here, sweetheart. <laughs> this is the generalization of the method. She has to say it. Comes to the valuation of women in society. But when it comes to the valuation of women in society. But you don't seem very concerned. You're more concerned about us using the term. You're more concerned about policing the language that we use. If you were concerned about bigger, broader issues like you just mentioned a damn minute ago, then maybe this video would be geared toward the culture that requires women to wear cloth bags. Society. But when you stop valuing the personhood and visibility of individuals, you make it easier to dehumanize. Is that an example? Look what she just showed. There's a woman standing in the middle, and the guys shake hands. They have to cross the woman. But when you stop valuing the personhood and visibility, and then watch. And visibility of individuals. This is not a easy. thing. This is not a thing. You're right. Nope. This, is, this is not it, a thing. It isn't. I like the way she's wearing the black and white. <laughs> We used to stand and, up. And red, red cup, red, black, and, and white. Red. That, there's your yep. communism colors. There's, there's uh, your... When a, listen, when a lady walked in the room, men used to stand. Not for other men, but when a lady walked in the room to join a group, every every man would stand yep. in respect to that woman walking in the room. Very true. And in, and in some cases, that still happens, P perhaps largely a rare occasion, but... It does still happen. Chivalry yeah. is not dead. Let's no, not you guys with you guys with only seven minutes to go. I don't want to detract, but uh, I right. see like a quasi Masonic uh, handshake here. I don't know about anyone else. Uh, yes. Yeah, yeah, I guess yes. he maybe. This is maybe this so. is so clearly propaganda. It isn't even funny. Here to dehumanize them on a macro scale, minimizing his, her, its, their right. Stop right there. His, her, its their 
right to respect and equality. Um, who identifies themselves as it? This is de this is dehumanizing. This is it, like you this, don't want to yeah, call a baby that you don't know its gender it, and that's that's it. Who identifies it, themselves as it? Not me. Hey, you guys, this is culture creation. This is like what Alan Watt would always go back to: is they're creating the culture. Cultural um, Marxism. Yeah, well, uh, listen to some Alan Watt about cultural creation. Like it's manufactured. It's meant to become the new, new culture and it's propaganda that's pushing that it's not a natural development in society you, no. know, you, you go out and you ask anyone hey do, don't you think it's a good idea that a uh, trans uh women are allowed to go into the bathroom 99 percent of people that you'll confront like say you could go go to go to any go to a mall go uh ask a random person a woman a man a teenager don't you think it's wrong that trans people aren't allowed to use this washroom what do you think 90 percent of those people are going to say to you they're going to say fuck that shit that's that's fucking retarded um they're not going to say oh yeah it's they're being oppressed it's it's this online fake culture that they're trying to develop it's not the mentality of the real humanity real people outside of the internet outside of the the news cycle this is fake this, this is the worst kind of propaganda because it contradicts itself at every turn. Just two seconds ago, this woman said, but when you stop valuing the personhood and visibility, and then literally, let me see, we are at 2.25, 2 minutes 25 seconds, literally eight seconds later, she says this, minimizing his, her, its, their, right, its. This is this I'm is I'm minimizing uh, its right. How do I minimize its right? If you identify, if you self-identify as it, you've already minimized your own fucking right and your own personhood. Yes. Which is which is the the goal. This is my you just broke my brain, lady. <laughs> this is linguistic programming. This whole thing is programming. Yes. And it's and it's and it is consistent with all the other programming to break your brain, okay, to have you see yourself no longer as a him or a her, but as it, as an object, not a spiritual being experiencing uh, life as a, as, a, as a part of a virus infesting a planet. And this is the way they go about doing it. This is just a, a very sort of fringe um, part of it. That yeah. last that last eight seconds literally just fucking broke my brain. When she so, goes when she goes on and on and she says uh, talking about dehumanizing and minimizing people's visibility, and then she goes on to say, "Well, we don't want to minimize and dehumanize people who identify as it, do we?" What the holy fuck are we talking about? She just did exactly what she said we ought not to do. Yep. But look, Rufus, let me quickly say, you were surprised that eight people, percent of the people that um, this uh, cannibal promotion, promoting guy got to admit that they would eat human flesh. Yeah, yeah. And then I took a poll in my audience. Yeah. But you see, this was these are both straw polls. And now he has just stood in front of that group of people and told them why they should. Okay, and about 8% is, is about 12% less than placebo. So if he could only convince 8% of his audience that what he was promoting was okay, he lost. He failed. Oh, so really? Oh, really? So placebo is what, 20%? Yeah, so he should have gotten 20% of those people to agree with him no matter what he was talking about. If he was a oh, interesting awesome. point. Fantastic point there. Bravo. Yes. So don't be disheartened. People are not interested in eating each other. Um, I couldn't not... get anybody in my audience to even. The, the question was, would you try it? And we're not yeah. talking about you know survival. We're not talking about life or death survival scenario. We're talking about hey, yeah. uh, life is good, and here try some human. Uh, no thanks. Yeah. You know what I mean? You can only <laughs> to agree after giving them a two-hour talk or whatever. On the on the benefits and and how it's not a problem and 
and and if he's had all that time to convince them that it's not so bad and he only got eight percent of them then then he failed miserably in his attempt to that's to, uh, i'm so glad you brought that up me Fan too excellent point I, I would give you a round of applause but i'd overload my mic i'm sure i think that that's probably a, a good place to um to leave this because it shows that there is hope um humanity does have oh the difference between morals and ethics yeah, oh. Amy, Amy, do it, do it, Amy, go now, go now. Really ethics the is something you agree on. The difference between morals and ethics is that morals are subjective, ethics are not. Yes. It is, it is moral to stone a woman to death for wearing a bikini in public some places, but not others. Uh, however, it is never ethically acceptable to do it. We do not kill, hurt or kill the flesh of another. We do not take or damage stuff that doesn't belong to us. And we do not defraud one another. That's ethics. Awesome. Morals, morals can be anything that a group of people think is okay. So the main, the main takeaway is that morals are subjective. Ethics are objective. Yes. Yeah. And, and Daniel, I, I could hear you piping up. You tend to agree with that. Yeah, morals. Our morals are what we agree upon as being ethical Th through culture. Yeah, but ethics are rooted in uh, our psyche, but our morals are actually what we agree upon. Yes. As ethical. Cool. Excellent. Excellent job. Excellent job uh, explaining, and excellent job keeping it short and sweet. We are now at the ten-minute mark, and my friend Ray of Creation. Josh's stream is going to be fired up any minute now, and we, we, we're we good buddies, and we're trying not to step on each other's toes. Um, yeah, you sent me a link to that. I tried to go there last time, and I I found a creation channel, but I didn't see a live stream. So send me a link to his channel. I'll, and, uh, I'll, I'll, if... I'll, yep, I'll give you a link in Skype when we get done here. And uh, Daniel, thank you so much. It's been a fascinating conversation, and we will do this again. You're a super interesting guy to speak to. It's been an absolute pleasure, and I've enjoyed it thoroughly. So, i would be happy to return. Final thoughts, everybody. Love always, guys. Daniel, final thoughts. Yeah, love. Yeah, hey, the, uh, hey. Amy's right. It's love. Just, just focus on love and try to um, take all the fear out of your life and anger, because that they, they, they do harm that you don't understand. Physical, spiritual, mental. If you just focus on love, at the, the instant you feel a bit of road rage coming on, uh, beat it. Okay, kick it down, stop it, and eventually you won't get angry at people on the road anymore. It'll take about 21 days, and your entire um, <laughs> mission will change, and you'll stop getting angry, and you'll stop being afraid. And if you can do that, um, everything in your life will change. You'll be healthier. You'll be happier. And... Um, yeah, well, that's, yeah. That's, my, that's my final thought. Excellent, Daniel, and thank you again for your time. It's been a pleasure. Dan, uh, Gandalf, you want to say something finally? Final thought? I guess he's not. Oh. He, he dropped off. Okay, he's he, he, we he's got gone a, to run. We, we got a runner. He's gone to watch Ray of Creation. We got a runner. All right, you guys know my final thought. It's the same as always. Be good to each other and pick up your damn trash. And with that, I thank you, and, and we will see you next week. And um, I'm not sure what we have planned for next week, but I do have Ken Humphreys. He's a biblical scholar. His uh, YouTube channel is called um, Jesus Never Existed. And when I get him, I, I, I'm in the email contact with him, and he's interested. It's just a matter of scheduling. Uh, that's going to be a fascinating conversation. The guy is brilliant. He's debated at Oxford. This guy is no joke. And um, also we have Allison Twist O'Neill has actually agreed to come on and discuss Reiki. And uh, when we get a chance to do that, we'll get that scheduled. And we're going to let her come on and discuss what Reiki is all about. And I'm going to give her a hard time because I don't believe in it. But we're going to have a respectful conversation. And... Um, so we're going to give her a chance to explain her position and we're going to go over what kind of proofs and evidence we can come up with. And we'll, that should be an interesting conversation. And I'm glad that Daniel mentioned the placebo at 20%. I wasn't sure of what percentage placebo had an effect. 
But um, Allison and I have been in, had a long email conversation lately, very recently, ongoing, in fact, on the subject of Reiki, and I keep bringing up the placebo effect. And so thank you, Daniel. I wasn't aware of the 20% margin, so thanks for that. Um, so look out, Allison. I got a I got a clinical psychologist who just gave me the 20% margin on placebo. So it can be higher. So so it can be higher than 20%. It could be 20 to 30%. So bear that in mind. Okay. So we're going to be going over those things. And Allison, if you would like to come join us next week, maybe we can schedule that. And uh, it'll be as respectful as always. There will be no attacking, and uh, we'll make you feel warm and welcome. You can share your ideas. But uh, do be prepared that I will be challenging your ideas. I will respect you as a person, and I will challenge your ideas. So with that, everybody, be good to each other. Pick up your trash, and we will see you next week. I'm out. <laughs>